Hello, everyone. It's Pat. I forgot who I was. <laughs> Profiler Pat Brown. <laughs> I'm doing really well this morning. Okay. It's actually, actually this afternoon. And I just got over COVID. So that's not my excuse. All right. Hi, I'm criminal profiler Pat Brown, and I'm glad you're all here today. Uh, <laughs> I actually didn't get much sleep last night because I spent a lot of time analyzing, uh, actually, the Sandra Milgar case. Uh, this case, Jeffrey Pine, not as much, but Sandra Milgar, oh my gosh, there was so much to go through. So mm, I may be only half here in brain, but I am here, and there's so much to talk about. It's, it's, it's insane, absolutely insane. So first of all, oh, Lisa says she can hear and see me. Great. I'm trying something new today. I managed to get rid of autofocus because I was having this problem of things going in and out and I've got it on manual focus and it's the first time. So I'm hoping it works. All right. Before I start, because these are two very, very, let's say it this, people are very, very emotionally involved with these two cases. Um, uh, many, many people believe these two persons are innocent of the crimes they were uh, convicted for. Uh, Je Jeffrey Pine over here was convicted of killing his mother in an absolutely brutal crime. And Sandra Melgar was convicted of killing her husband over here in a very br brutal crime. So absolutely, uh, you know, they, they were horrific cases. And so many, many people think that these two were convicted without having solid evidence. And I'm going to address that today. And I'm going to address a lot of the issues. And before I start, I want to point this out because I think it's really important to point out because people sometimes do not understand this channel. I do not tell crime stories. I'm not going to tell you the, all the cool details and how everything went down and you can be all fascinated with all kinds, you know, with great editing and great pictures and, and video. That's not happening uh, because I don't do that. I teach. Uh, this is a, this is a, this is a channel that I try to educate people. So everyone who's coming here, I hope, are profiling pupils, not people trying to, you know, prove them innocent or prove them guilty. I want profiling pupils. They might be detectives. They might be criminal justice students. They might be any of any person who's interested in understanding criminal profiling and crime scene analysis and understanding how criminals work, just to learn things because I, I believe in lifelong learning. Uh, but this is not a this is not a channel for everybody to come and fight over whether they're guilty or innocent and and come here and go crazy and you know sometimes I have to block a lot of people who come here with agendas. This is not an agenda channel. This is an educational channel. So welcome profiling pupils. And if you're not here to learn, you know there's other channels for you. <laughs> there are other channels for you. So um, so before I get started, because this is going to be, I want to mention first that I'm going to talk about. Let me get my second. Jeffrey Pine here. That's going to be a very short. I'm going to talk about him very in a very short period of time um, because there's not as much involved with his case. There's a few things that are interesting, but it's not a very complicated case. Sandra Melgar. Oh, my goodness. You know, when when I looked at the Stephen Avery case, uh, making a murderer thing, <clears throat> uh you know, people were saying, oh, my God, this this Stephen Avery is innocent. And I looked at the case. I'm like, oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> guys, guilty as all get out. And if you want to know why, watch my video on on Stephen Avery. Um, Kathleen Zellner is his attorney. She did Making Murderer 2, I believe. And she she uh, she presents a lot of information, which is simply not credible. Uh, but she's a defense attorney and likes the limelight. Sorry, Kathleen just not a fan. Um, not saying you can't have, don't have the right. You do, but not a fan. Okay. Now she has now taken up the case of Sandra Melger because, well, because she likes the limelight. Now that doesn't mean that she's, that Sandra Melger is guilty or innocent. It just means that, well, she's been found guilty, but uh, now Kathleen Zellner is going to try to free her because so many people do believe she's innocent. So I started looking at the, this case and I'm like, Wow, this has got to be one of the weirdest cases I've ever encountered. It is so bizarre, so confusing, so convoluted, so questionable about so many issues. This is not for me a straight up, hey, Stephen Avery had a, you know, the girl is burned up in his backyard and he's got the key in his house. I'm sorry. The dude's guilty. 
this is a much more complex case, but it's, there are so many things about this case, which nobody talks about and nobody even, even questions it. And it just drives me crazy. I started looking at going, why is nobody asking this question? And so please hang in. Um, I'm going to be, it's, it's important to find out about, uh, what I want to say about Jeffrey Pine, but my God, if you're into what, how the heck she could have been convicted, what evidence was there? Should she be, is she really innocent? Please hang in because I've got, you know, I wrote questions about this case. Why didn't anybody say this? What about this? I've got 32 of them. I haven't slept well because <laughs> there's so many interesting, fascinating questions about this case, which some of them I'm going to answer during the show. I'm going to prove to you certain things. Uh, and then other things are just going to be something you're going to have to, you know, think about. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, so before I get started, uh, I will do the needful, as I call it, hmm, do the needful, um, <laughs> because uh, I do need to survive. And, you know, I, I, as I as I ask, as I point this out today, uh, just before I start, please do subscribe to the channel. If you keep coming here, please just subscribe. It's not going to cost you anything. <laughs> you don't have to pay me a penny. Just subscribe. It helps the channel greatly. Please do like because the algorithms like, like, uh, please do share on true cram channels. And sh you know, if you like this show and you think it's really interesting, I got, you know, people can learn from it, share it in true crime groups. Um, cause there's so many on Facebook and then hit the bell. If you want to know about my other stuff. Also, if you want to just contribute to the channel on a uh, you know, monthly basis, please do even a dollar a month, $3 a month. Or if you want to join in my hangouts a little bit on my third level, please do go to Patreon. The link is below and you can always buy one of my books. Two ninety nine, great story. Okay, but I, I also want to point something else out because, oh my God, um, this was so. This was absolutely so sweet from Benny. Thank you, Benny. Very, very. Where is it? Why does it say hide? What? Wait a minute. Said, that is the weirdest thing ever. It says hide. What? Okay, hold on a second. Something fishy is happening here. What you? No. What? This is so weird. Okay, I have no idea what the heck this is going on. Benny, wonderful Benny, when I'm uh, just uh, gave me a super sticker, and and I have super I have super chat now, which means you can during the show during a live show you can contribute to the channel. And I was really opposed to this, but I accidentally started it. <laughs> and some people have been contributing, and oh my god, it makes a difference, and because. The demonetization is heavy on crime channels. Um, so thank you, Benny. I don't know why this thing won't come up when I clicked on it. But I want to I want to mention one other one other channel uh, before I go on. On YouTube, there's a channel called um, Murder Academy. Murder Academy, and I will put it in the link below. Uh, it's run by a guy by the he's a former Scotland Yard detective inspector. His name is Stephen, and I can't pronounce his last name. Keo. K E O G H K O, and he started a channel, and he's got like um, I don't know how many people he's got, and how many people does he have? Hold on a second, let me, let me find this out. Um, he's got like he's got almost as many subscribers as me. Um, he hasn't been around long. Um, he's done some. He's got some really good things to say. And it's kind of funny because one of my subscribers actually said something about me in one of the comments, and he said, "I don't know who the heck she is," <laughs> and I don't agree with her. But, but it's okay. Um, uh, I like that he is just, he is educating and he's trying to describe how uh, a, a Scotland Yard detective would work, uh, how they would analyze cases. And you know me, I'm big on education. And so he's doing that a lot. But you know, the sad thing was he just came up with a, with a video that said, you know, I may not be able to do this murder academy anymore because he's having trouble with, with Google and Google AdSense and and he can't make enough money to quit his day job or even to just do the amount of work you have to do uh, to keep this channels going. And so he doesn't think he's going to be able to continue. And I'm like, oh, man, I actually, you know, you may be my competition, but, dude, I like you, you know, and I want you to be able to continue because you're teaching people. Uh, but he's already saying, I don't know if I can do this because, you know, so that is why we do have to sit here and be obnoxious and ask, ask for support because. It's not easy when you're a crime channel because they demonetize the living heck out of you. So thank you, Benny. And uh, that's why I do have I'm doing what I'm doing these days. Oh, <laughs> thank you. This one, this one, this one's sort of coming up. Thank you very much. And, you know, Evelina, I, Evelina, I don't know if to pronounce your name, Evelina or Evelina. I've never quite figured that out. Is it with a V or a W? 
do tell me because I, I you know I keep saying Evelina but I don't know if that's proper thank you so much um th no this really does help so anyway I want to get now to the issues okay so we're going to start and do have a little patience uh interesting enough you know how I always start with Wikipedia <laughs> Wikipedia doesn't have any anything on these two cases I'm like how can you not have anything on these two cases but they don't so we're going I'm going to start with all right. No, oh, what? Am I in the right place here? Oh no, that's not where I want to be. Okay, let me move up. Mm, okay, here we go. All right. Sorry, you know what? Some people wonder why I put the wrong things up. It's because it's because because on Streamyard, which is the the method I use to go on here, it be teeny weeny little pictures, and you're like, which one is that? <laughs> I can't actually bloody well see it. So, oh, uh, and and thank you, thank you, Miss Leah, so much. I appreciate it. God, don't know how much I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Jeffrey Pine. Now, Jeffrey, the reason I want to start with Jeffrey Pine is because it's, this is a simpler case, but it has very much similarities to the Sandra Melger case. Oh, wait, before I start, this is my whole point of the show. All right. It's about Casey Anthony. And you say, what? What would this have to do with Casey Anthony? Okay. The problem with both these cases uh, where Jeffrey Pine has, a, has been convicted of killing his mother in absolutely a brutal, brutal attack, and, and, and uh, Sandra Melger has also been accused of killing her husband in a horrible, brutal attack, neither case had very good physical evidence of them actually killing the person they're accused of killing. So now here's my question to you before we start. I, I just want you to think about this. Remember, this is an educational channel, so I try to teach here. Not just say, hey, this person is guilty or innocent. Okay, here's my question. Should Casey Anthony have been convicted when there was not physical evidence that she killed Kaylee? You would think back, almost everybody. And I did a whole, I just did a thing on Casey Anthony. And, and pretty much, you know, I think she killed Kaylee. And I think she should have been convicted. And that the, the jury, I think, got it wrong and drove me absolutely insane. When I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? But one of the claims was, well, we didn't know if she actually did it. And she could have, you know, you know, maybe her daddy made her crazy by, by molesting her, even though there's no proof. And maybe she just acts weird. Okay. But it's true. It is true. There was actually not any physical evidence that Casey Anthony killed her daughter, Kaylee. There wasn't. There wasn't a video of her killing her. There wasn't blood spatter pattern on Casey Anthony. There wasn't. There wasn't actual 100% physical proof. Now, also, someone else could have done it. In theory, okay, so so there was, those, so it, sound, it smelled like a dead body in the trunk. Oh, so there maybe was a dead body in the trunk, but maybe one of her boyfriends killed Kay, Kay, Kaylee and she just didn't know what to do about it. So she just hid. You know, could have happened. No motive was proven. Well, that's true. Do we know why Casey would have killed Anthony, uh, Kaylee? Well, we think she killed her because she was just tired of dealing with her and she didn't want to be a mother anymore and she wanted to be free. But hey, was that proven? No. Oh, and how about this? You can't judge guilt on personality. Okay, so she partied for a whole month while her daughter was missing. You know, people respond differently. If her daughter drowned in the pool and her daddy made her hide the body, maybe that's why she partied because she just couldn't deal with it, you see? You can't blame somebody because of their personality. And here's the final thing about this. You shouldn't convict on entirely circumstantial evidence. So now this is what's really interesting. The majority of people I've dealt with, and on, on YouTube as well, will say, Casey Anthony killed Kaylee. That woman should be in, in prison. But interestingly, when I look at this case of Jeffrey Pine, I don't see that response. And I don't see the same. What, Sandra Melger? Absolutely not. I looked at one channel on Sandra Melger and, and it was like, like a, they had like a million subscribers and like a couple thousand uh, comments. And, and I would say 95% of the comments said Sandra Melger is innocent and she should never have been convicted because it was not anything but circumstantial evidence. So Casey Anthony should have been convicted, but not Jeffrey Pine, not Sandra Melger. Okay, so now the question comes down to is, is there a difference between these two cases I'm going to talk about today and Casey Anthony, or just 
is it just more a case of what our emotions tell us? And this, this is, and this, so it's very interesting. So let's start with Jeffrey Pine. Okay, let me let me stop here. <laughs> let me stop with Benny. And yes, Casey should have been convicted. There was no reasonable doubt because the totality of the evidence and the duct tape. I agree with you, Benny. I've been fighting this forever. The totality of the evidence says Casey Anthony did it. But there is actually no more proof in the Casey Anthony case than there will be in the two cases I'm going to discuss today. So the question is, is there a difference? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I believe Casey should have been oh, I'm having this strange problem again where half of half of the half of my letters are missing. So this is like, guess what the person was saying? <laughs> I believe Casey should have been convicted. And the Scott Peterson case failed to establish blah, 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 blah. what the heck? I'm gonna read it over here. I believe Casey should have been convicted in the Scott Peterson case. What should have been convicted in the Scott Peterson case, the prosecutors failed to establish when the murder occurred or the manner of death, yet he was convicted. Now, you see, in this, and I'll do a Scott Peterson later, but that's very interesting. All right, let me get, let me get here to Jeffrey Pine. Okay, there's a movie called The Perfect Family, it's done by 48 Hours, and it is absolutely quite interesting. It's not a bad show, so you might want to look that one up. I found that the, the title interesting, The Perfect Family. So here, over here, you see The Perfect Family, and they do look lovely. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is Jeffrey. He's, a, at this point, an attractive-looking guy, and he lost his, he went bald really young, so, and a really unfortunate balding pattern, so poor schmuck. I mean, in that sense, you know, he, he, got, he got the bad genetic thing from daddy here. Okay, uh, and this is his mother, Ruth, and that's his little, little sister, and this is his daddy. Okay. They said the perfect family. But what's fascinating about this family is they, they weren't so perfect. Um, and this is an important thing because when we look at the Sandra Melgar case, we're going to see something quite different. In Sandra Melgar case, almost everybody around Sandra Melgar says they were a happy couple. Sandra supposedly murdered her husband, right, After, on, 30, on her 32nd anniversary. They were happy, happy, happy. All the past is happy, happy, happy. This is not exactly true with this case. So this is very important. All right. What really happened here is that th these two got married. They met very young um, and, and they, they got married and things were going well. But then all of a sudden, Sandra started has some real psychological issues, some psychotic issues. She started getting very paranoid that people were in her brain and things were, you know, the usual, oh, my God, people are watching us and all kinds of strange things. And, and she became very difficult to deal with. And she, um, at one point, actually attacked, attacked her son and tried to strangle him. Uh, and she would, she was on, supposed to be on medication, but as many people have problems, and sometimes people have uh, certain psychotic disorders, and mental disorders, they refuse to take their medication because they believe the medication is, you know, the government's making me take this medication, so the medication is, is evil. Uh, so they won't take the medication because they become paranoid about it. She refused, and so she had trouble controlling her psychotic issues. And at one point, yeah, you know, during the show, one of the things you're going to see is they show so many wonderful pictures of the family doing wonderful things, you know, going to the zoo and that kind of stuff, you know, everybody happy. And, and all still pictures look great. And I always point out to people, <laughs> it's kind of interesting because sometimes you'll see a still picture, like somebody went to Olin Mel's and got their family portrait taken, and then the next day the dad killed all the people in the family. <laughs> but they were all smiling the day before. Pick, still pictures mean nothing. They do not tell you what's happening actually in the family unit behind those closed doors. And, 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 and Sandra was definitely had major issues. It got so bad that daddy over here, six months before she was murdered, had an affair because he was like, he couldn't get her to take her meds. He was depressed. He started, he ended up having an affair with a woman. He, he, he I think she was from work or something. He had an affair. Well, one day, Sandra went into a restaurant and saw her husband hanging out with somebody who wasn't her. And she got very upset. And he said, she said, you know, uh, you know, how, how could you do this to me? And, and he said, you know, I've given up, you know, because you won't take your meds and I want a divorce. And she said, if I take my meds, will you not give me the divorce? And he agreed to that. He, so he basically gave up his extramarital affair and she went back on her meds and things were going kind of well for those six months, supposedly. Supposedly. All right. So meanwhile, so, so when we look at the behaviors 
are there motives? The motives in this particular case, he was not having a happy family life. He was he was upset his dad actually returned to his mom. He wanted the divorce. And I think he just want the claim is that he wanted to protect his little sister. Now, I don't know that that's true because apparently I don't know that the little sister was ever treated badly, but something happened. She like didn't treat him as well. So I don't know whether she had some weird concept in her head about him or whether he had some personality disorder that she couldn't handle. I don't know. But this is not the perfect family. It wasn't. It was a mess. And so they tr they were trying hard to be a good family. I'm not saying they weren't. They were, you know, he he was a val valedictorian of his school. You know, there's, I mean, I look at the pictures and you can see they have on the wall, you know, one of those pictures where every year they take a picture of their kids and they put them in a row. There's a lot of lovely things about this family. But she had a psychiatric disorder that was very, very difficult to deal with. And he had lived with that for many, many years. And I don't know whether he, you know, what was going on between the two of them, but there was, there were problems. So Jenny Wright, let's go to what happened then, therefore. All right. So let me, let me just read this because it's not, it's an, again, it's, it's odd, oddly. Okay. I want to point this out. Um, she was on a lot of medications. And he was ending up taking care of his little sister a good portion of the time because mom was on a lot of medications and needed to be, but she had issues. So he was doing a lot of taking care of his, 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 his sister. Now, let me read to you what it says about what he got convicted of. Because it's not on Wikipedia. This is from the actual case details from uh, the, the, uh, the legal situation here. The defendant's conviction arises from bludgeoning and stabbing his 51-year-old mother, Ruth Payne, at their house in Michigan on May 27, 2011. Evidence indicated that the defendant and his mother had a tumultuous relationship fueled by his mother's failure to take her medication for bipolar disorder. The prosecutor's theory at the trial was that the defendant had become increasingly frustrated about living with his mother's mental illness and other events in the months preceding the crime, which, by the way, his his, his, his girlfriend testified in court, his ex-girlfriend, that he cheated on her and that in the months before this all happened, that his behavior had changed. He had become angry. He had been saying, saying bad things about his mother and that he cheated on her. And she was like, she said, you know, I always thought he was like the perfect guy. And now I find he can lie to me with a straight face. And she says, I can't I can't believe that that underneath that he was not what I thought he was, which is interesting. Because does that mean he has a personality disorder? I don't know. Okay, and uh, so the, the crime, uh, the mo his emotional state led to the violent attack. Now, this is what happened. On the afternoon of May 27, 2011, at approximately 2.30 p.m., the defendant's father, and uh, let, me, let me show you the defendant's father. And I feel kind of bad about the defendant's father because um, uh, dad, um, dad, he was first accused of being the guy who killed his wife because, after all, he's, he had had an extramarital affair, and, you know, people are like, yeah, you did it. Um, but he didn't do it. Um, he really didn't. Um, let's, let's picture daddy. Okay. Here's dad. And, and you know, he did this uh, on 48 hours. He did this interview and he, he cried so much during his interview and it was real crying. I mean, he is definitely devastated about, about his family. I don't know if he's so devastated about his wife because, you know, he's already having issues, but about his whole family. Uh, and then his son was arrested for it. And he just, he does not believe his son did this. He is adamant. His son loved his mother and would never have done this. I would say dad's probably in denial. But all right. So anyway, dad came home, found Ruth, his wife, lying in a pool of blood in the garage. He contacted the police. Ruth had a large wound on the back of her skull and multiple stab wounds on her neck. OK, so she was hit with a with a board about this big. So somebody picked up a board in the garage and whacked her repeatedly on the head until she collapsed. After she collapsed, the person then went and found a knife and then stabbed her to death in the neck. The front door was locked with a dead bolt, and there was no sign of forced entry, theft, or a struggle inside the house, also no sexual assault. Blood stains on the garage door indicated that the door, garage door was closed at the time of the incident. So when you're look, talking about somebody coming in from the outside, there was no evidence that anybody came in from the outside. After finding Ruth's body, the defendant's father summoned the defendant, which is which is which is Jeff here, 
they called him and he said, come home, something's happened. And Jeff came home and he told him his mother had been murdered. And and and, and they asked him on the show, what, what was Jeff's response? And he said he couldn't remember, which I thought was really interesting because, you know, if I, if my, if I called my son's home and said, you know, by the way, your dad, your dad has been murdered, I would expect them to freak out. I would expect to be consoling them. If I can't remember how they behaved, I'm going to say they didn't respond. Like nothing happened. So it was like, okay. Anyway, um, now when he, he had bandages that were covering his hand. There were blisters on his hands. Let me show you the pictures of the blisters on his hands. Um, blisters on his hands. Where are they? Okay, this is this is a fascinating part of the case. Uh, da, 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 where are they? Oh, yeah, so here we go. See, over here, um, there are blisters. There's one here and there's one here, which are interesting because actually if you gr see, see they're in here, if you grab a piece of wood and you're slamming somebody, the, fat, the wood going like this would indeed make blisters on this part of a hand. However, he claimed that he got them when he was working uh, throwing some pallets. And in, uh, during the trial, they brought some of the uh, co-workers out and said, hey, does that happen to you when you throw pallets? And they're like, never, never. And oddly, it happened on the very day. He had bandages on the very day his mother got murdered. <clears throat> okay. And you see those are the bandages he's on his hands. All right. The prosecutor theorized that the defendant's injuries were inconsistent with his explanation and instead had resulted from repeatedly swinging the murder weapon. Now, now pay attention to what this, this next part is. The defendant claimed that he received, oh God, uh, sorry. Defendant told the police that his mother was lying in her bed when he left home at 1.30 p.m. So he was home with his mother until 1.30 p.m. That is a fact according to Jeffrey. Then, then he left the home at 1.30 p.m. to perform yard work for someone. That's a neighbor of his. The, the, he, he actually claimed to the police that he went to the neighbor's house and planted these little uh, lilac trees. And then there was this message that was left for that neighbor that said, oh, you know, uh, I went over to your house because she wasn't home. I went over to your house and I did some cleanup. It doesn't mention any lilac tr trees at all. Apparently he was actually never there. So he left this message to claim he had gone to the neighbor's house. That raised the suspicions of the police that this was just a fake alibi. Um, and then he was scheduled to work at 3 p.m. at this, this place where he was throwing pallets. Uh, the defense theory at the trial was the defendant was not at home when Ruth was killed, and therefore there was no direct evidence linking him to his mother's death. Okay, so here we go. There is no absolute evidence on outside of these, these, these blisters that proves, quote, he killed his mother. All right. Um, however, there are some other things. Let me see if I can find the other things about, uh, there was, hold on a second. Cause there's, uh, there is, there was blood. There was blood in the, okay, hold on. I got to find it. Um, there was blood in a sink, like, like, like in the garage, which a pair. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, the laundry tub drain and the laundry tub's faucet handles had, they, they found Ruth Pine's blood on them, uh, on these things. And they figured he was trying to clean up. And also the, the board was missing from the garage. Okay. Now, originally what the prosecutor did was charge him with first, first degree murder. That was a premeditated murder. And why did they do that? Uh, the prosecutor said, look, after he beat her with the, the board, then he said, well, you know, I got to kill her now. And the board ain't going to do it. So he went and got the knife and then stabbed her. That's premeditated murder. However, in court, he said, okay, okay, let's just introduce a second degree, not premeditated. And the defense was very upset about this because they thought that the, the, the jury would like, okay, you know, I really don't know. So let's just go a second degree. But actually they had a good point. Although it's true that if you stop and then go get the knife and come back, it is premeditated. The whole concept of the homicide in general is that he lost his mind. In other words, he had issues with his mother. He had per some kind of some kind of mental issues going on. Something happened between the two of them when she ran into the garage. He followed her, and he became angry, and 
she was probably running from him and he hit her. And then once he had hit her enough, he realized he had no choice because he was going to go to prison. He decided to kill her and try to pretend he didn't do it. So I get it. It doesn't, it, you know, it, it, what people call, what people call, um, you know, uh, they, they think it's like temporary insanity kind of thing. Um, but it's not really, it's like you've been pushed over the edge more. It's more of that case. It, it's, it's not so you didn't snap. They love the word snap. It's like, no, you're a perfectly happy person. Everything's fine. Everything's normal. And then you snap and kill somebody. No, you don't do that. It's usually something leading up to it. And then you lose, you go over the edge, but the, the mindset has always been there, but this is the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So do I think Jeffrey Pine killed his mother? Yes, I do. Um, the fact that he was there till 1.30, and as soon as he leaves, somebody comes in and kills her. No robbery, no sexual assault. They get through they, the doors. There's no, there's no way into the house, but somehow they get into the house and get out of the house and kill her for no reason whatsoever. And he happens to have you know, blisters on his hands, and he happens to lie about where he was. I'm going to say Jeffrey Pine is guilty. Now, the question a lot of times when you say somebody's guilty and the, and the jury found him guilty is people are saying, but there wasn't absolute proof at that moment that he actually killed his mother because it wasn't okay. There was washing off in the sink, some blood in the sink, but that doesn't mean it was him. It could have been somebody else. Well, it's, it's like Casey Anthony. When you put the totality of everything together, you go, you know, that somebody else did it is, is like, is like near zero, you know, and everything points to him. I'm sorry, Dad. I know you love your son, and you can't believe it, and you don't want to believe that your wife drove your son to be what it, to murder her. But you know, sometimes things are the way they are. All right. So, do I think he killed his mother? Uh, evidence, I think, is in the totality, is yes. I did not think it was an overly difficult case. Now, some people say, well, there wasn't enough proof in the in the court. Well, then you could say the same thing about Casey Anthony. So. That's where I stand on this. And there are people, there's innocence, people going about his innocence and want the innocent project get involved and get this guy to prison because they feel like he was this valedictorian. He was this nice guy. And yeah, you know, is he, he got screwed. Um, but I think the evidence is, you know, probably he did it. Now let's go to Sandra Melgar and this case. <sighs> wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I mean, Mm -mm -mm. This case is, uh, this is probably one of the most interesting cases I've ever run into. And, and it, I want to, okay. I want to be really clear about this case because people are so emotional about this case. And again, I'm a profile. I don't get emotional. <laughs> I look at all the issues and I say to myself, okay, what does the evidence show? And, and so many things have, have been wrong about this case on both sides of whether you think she's innocent or guilty. They've just said some stuff that's just stupid. Okay. So I'm going to try to get rid of stupid stuff and go with stuff that makes some damn sense. Okay. So let me explain the basics about the Sandra Melgar case. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me get rid of all the other things out here so I can find the basics on again, no Wikipedia page on Sandra Melgar, which I don't understand why not, but anyway, okay. Let me just tell you just, Basically what happened. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Uh, blah. Sorry. Hold on. That's not the page. Let me find the page. Uh, that's not the page. Okay. That's not the page. Sorry. Hold on one second. You got to be patient here. Okay. Can we Okay. Here we go. All right. Let's see if I can get the. Okay. This is. Oh, by the way, I have really great links below on the Sandra Melgar case. I have a, a, a YouTube channel, which has like a hundred the guy is like a hundred, like a hundred subscribers, but I really thought he did a great job. I don't know. He, he took a lot of clips from things and then he did it in a very deadpan voice about what he thought. Of. It just basically this, 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 and this. I, I found it very useful. So I'm going to give, I gave him a shout out below. Um, and so you can go click on his thing and he's got all the links to the television documentaries, podcasts, and other things. So you can go from his his YouTube channel to the other, all these other links. And you can learn a lot about the Sandra Melgar case. So I think it's very, very useful. Okay. Now I'm hot. All right. Sandra Melgar, this happened in Texas. Let me just give you the very simple background. Then I want to talk about what's in, who they were. Okay. So basically what happened is 
they were married for 32 years. They met very young. Uh, 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 Jaime, uh, which some people say, ja Hi some what they say, Jim, some people say Jamie, but he's from Guatemala. So I'm going to say Jaime. Jaime, Jaime is from Guatemala. He moved to the United States when he was young. They met as, I think, teens. They got married young. They were married for 32 years, okay? When, theoretically, she, she supposedly murdered her husband. Now, um, <clears throat> so I want to point this out. Okay, so this is a big issue in this case. This is why I'm going to point it out. Um, they, after they got married, they became Jehovah's Witnesses. All right. Now, I want to clear up a lot of issues about the Jehovah's Witness stuff because it's being used in this case by the prosecution in a way that I don't quite agree with. And also some of the documentaries are kind of off on this, but there are some points that are also accurate. So let me let me just clear it all up for you because a lot of people don't understand this. All right. They, they joined the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is a... A, a particular religion in the United States. Uh, they do not go to churches. They go to kingdom halls. Okay. So that's a fair thing. Don't, people can say, oh, well, they went to church. They didn't go to church. They went to kingdom hall. Uh, that's what they're called. Um, do not have steeples. Okay. Um, kind of a simple, simple hall with, 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 with pews in it and, or seat or chairs in it, uh, a very different style than the majority of Christian churches. Now, one of, one of the shows, one of the documentaries on this said, oh, you know, it's been a year since Jaime was killed and the family is, you know, struggling because it's it's the 23rd of December and it's 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 holiday season and they show all this Christmas crap. I'm like, Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> they don't care it's holiday season. Meaningless. Why would you put this in your documentary except you suck as journalists? Okay, they don't celebrate Christmas. What they do celebrate is wedding anniversaries. They don't celebrate Christmas. They don't celebrate national holidays and they don't celebrate birthdays, but they do celebrate wedding anniversaries. And this was their 32nd wedding anniversary. So yes, that would be important to them. Not the fact that it's Christmas because they don't celebrate Christmas. So let's just get that straight. All right. Now, the other issue that you're going to see in this particular, oh, this whole thing about why she would kill her husband is that Jehovah's Witnesses are not in favor of divorce. That if you get divorced for any reason other than adultery, you can be excommunicated from the church, disfellowshipped. There is a truth in that. All right, so it's very tough to just divorce. And people do not understand the devastation it causes when you are disfellowshipped. Um, it's a little similar to the Amish in this um, because Jehovah's Witnesses, once they can become Jehovah's Witnesses, only pretty much associate with Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, it may be true that they go to work, uh, maybe they teach at a school, they work in their community, and they're very friendly to everybody, very friendly and polite and nice, some of the nicest people they ever meet, but doesn't mean they socialize with those people. They socialize with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So it becomes a very close family situation. So one, one goes to meeting two or three times a week, which is like the church service, but a meeting. Uh, and so when you go to the meeting, you, you go there, and all your brothers and sisters are there and all the children are there and you know everybody and it feels very warm and cuddly. And then when you want to go do something, you go to each other's houses, you have dinners, you have parties, you have fun, you go on vacations together. And if you travel the world, you can go to any uh, kingdom hall and, and people will welcome you and they'll welcome you to their homes and, you know, sisters and brothers all over the world that are Jehovah's Witnesses. So once you're part of the Jehovah's Witness community, that's, that's your family. Those are all your relatives. It's everybody to you. And if you get disfellowshipped, it's worse than divorce. I'm sorry, it is. I mean, I've been divorced and I know when I got divorced, it was hard. It broke up my family and... And, and I lost some, like, like my, my, my in-laws. I mean, they were still kind to me and all that, but it just wasn't the same as it was before. And then there are friends who just vanished because I don't know what side to pick. You know what I mean? So when you leave the Jehovah's Witnesses, you're on your own. You're thrown out there and you don't know anybody. You don't relate, you can't relate to people. So you lose all your friends, your family, everybody. It's de devastating. So, yes, there is a point to, 
if you divorce and you get disfellowship, you you may not be in a good situation. And so you can get divorced if the person you're with has committed adultery. And there's no proof that the Jaime here committed adultery. So the theory behind the prosecution, the, the prosecution is saying that Sandra wanted a divorce. She wanted to get away from him, but she couldn't divorce him because he hadn't committed adultery. But if he was murdered and she wasn't convicted, she would she would a get get his $500,000 insurance policy. So she'd have a lot of money because remember, she, she, she was not working at the time and had disabilities. So chances of her, she's in her fifties. She's not going to be working and getting a great job, but half a million dollars. She gets the house. She gets some of her rental properties and she keeps all her friends at the kingdom hall. Jehovah's witnesses. She comes off pretty well. So the prosecution had a reasonable concept that maybe she, she wanted out of the marriage, but this this was the better way. Sorry about this. I'm just like, what the heck is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hair issues. Uh, so it's like, what is that? Weird, what is that weird thing? Oh, you know? Okay. Weird things hanging down on my head. Okay. And it's going to be that way. All right. So, so she had a motive if there was problems in their marriage. Now, here's the issue about these two. Nobody says they have problems in their marriage. Nobody. The witnesses said they didn't. Uh, there was a little bit of noise. And I don't, again, here's where the gossip problem comes into. Somebody said they were seeing the elders about some issues. And what, what happens when, if, if you're in the, uh, you're a Jehovah's Witness and you have problems in your marriage, you are supposed to go see the elders of the church and try to work these things out. If that's true, then they may have had problems in their marriage. But I don't know that that's true. Uh, that everybody says they seem to be happy. His family says they seem to be happy. Um, the daughter, they have a one, one daughter who's grown. She said they seem to be happy. Um, however, I just want to mention this about the daughter. So things are not always perfect in paradise here. Although the Jehovah's Witness paradise will be coming after everybody dies and comes back. And then they'll be in paradise. But right now on earth, there isn't a paradise. But the daughter apparently married this, this, what her mother called a loser. Um, and he was into drugs and the daughter left the Jehovah's Witnesses and hooked up with this dude and things didn't go well. And she eventually divorced him. And then she married another guy and she lived in England. Now, while when, when he was murdered, the daughter was in England. So the daughter has nothing to do with anything here. Um, but the mother did say to that at some point she muttered that her daughter was had been depressed. And one reason they didn't want to keep a weapon or, or she didn't want a weapon available in the house is because her daughter was suicidal. So things are not perfect behind the scenes. That's just what I'm pointing out. We do not know what happens behind four walls. Okay. So I just want to straighten that up with the whole, uh, the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses issues. Would divorce be a problem for her? Yes. Does that, but was there proof that she was having problems with her husband? No. All right. So that's that about Jehovah's, the, the, the whole issue about their background. Now, what actually happened at, the, at, the, at this particular day? And you have to pay very close attention to what I'm going to say about what happened. All right. Because the problem with this whole case comes down to Sandra's story. Sandra told the story. She survived what was considered a home invasion. Supposedly, some people invaded her home, killed her husband in the most brutal attack. She was tied up and left in a closet with a chair that was uh, uh, stuck up under uh, the doorknob, you know, preventing her from leaving the closet. She lay there for hours. And then when her, his family came for dinner, they found her in the closet tied up. And then they found Jaime dead, brutally murdered. And it was supposed to be a home invasion. After this happened, she went and talked to the police and the police immediately suspected her of being the one who killed her husband. Why would they do this? Okay. I'm going to try to explain um, why this is. And I have, <laughs> I have like, Oh Lord. All right. Let, let me, let me, let me find all my stuff on Sandra Mugger. Okay. I want to point out something that they pointed out I, below. I also have a link to the appeal to the, the Texas uh, court. It's this, uh, it's called a factual sufficiency review. 
Sandra Jean Melger versus the state of Texas. She was convicted of this crime. She's spending a, pretty much a life in prison. She's got 27 some years or whatever she's got. Um, and they said they wanted to go up, the, they, they pointed out the difference between rational inference and speculation. And I want to point this out before we start. Rational inference is where you can look at evidence and say that evidence really points to this. And that's rational. Speculation is, you know, this could have happened when there's not really evidence pointing to it. This could have happened. Okay, so keep that in mind. I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through this case. So what happened on the evening? It was, it was like their anniversary. So they went out to this place. It was a Mexican restaurant. They went to this Mexican restaurant and had a dinner. This is proven. They went and had dinner. There's, there's evidence they went and had dinner. It gets interesting after that. Sandra says in her, and I also have a link to her, inter uh, to her interview below. I, I won't call it interrogation. It was an interview at that point. There's part one and part two. There's two parts of the interview uh, with the police. And you can walk, look at both of those parts if you click on the links below. She said, this is what she said, that they went out to, to eat at this Mexican restaurant, which they liked. And after that, they stopped at CVS and got some mixers so they could go home to their, uh, to their home. And they were planning to get in the jacuzzi and have some drinks and sit in the jacuzzi and, and drink. And the jacuzzi is in their bedroom, so it's not one of those outdoor ones. It's one of those, you know, bubbly things in your bath bathtub thing. And they were going to sit there and drink and, and, you know, have a nice time. She claimed that they got in the jacuzzi about 12 p.m. At some point later, she claimed, well, it could have been 11. Now, check this out. See behind me? That is a CVS pharmacy. Uh, they stopped on the way home to get this from the pharmacy. I think that I can't, you know, I can't, I can't read it from here. Shoot. Now I might have to pull it up in front. Hold on one second. Let me pull up the, let me, uh, let me pull up the, um, so I can see it big. Um, the exact time they, they, hold on a second. I've got so much open here. It's ridiculous. Where, where is it? Where is it? Uh, hold on a second. I'm on. Be patient with me, please. Be patient with me. I'm trying to find this. You know, when you do research, you end up with so many, so much junk that you can't even keep up with it. Okay, here it is. Okay. All right. The CVS. This is, this. they went and got their stuff at CVS. When did they leave CVS? They left CVS at 9.33 p.m. 9.33 p.m. Got their mixers to go home, have their drinks. Okay, where did they live? I looked it up. I looked up how far from CVS to their house. Four minutes. Four minutes. So if they left not, they left at 9.33. They were home by 9.40. Let's put it that way. 9.40. 9.40. So if they got in the tub at 12, PM, 12 a.m., what were they doing for two hours and 20 minutes? I'm sorry. Yeah, two hours and 20 minutes. What were they doing? Sandra says they got in the, 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 the jacuzzi at, at midnight. But that's, that cannot be true because there's two hours and 20 minutes. They supposedly came home, made the drinks, and went to the jacuzzi. There's two hours and 20 minutes of missing time. Now, now, now mind you, before you misunderstand how this all goes down, the claim is, Sandra says that once they got, they were in the jacuzzi. She claims they were in the jacuzzi for, let me show you, show you a picture of the jacuzzi. Um, where's the picture of the jacuzzi? Okay, they're home. Is this a picture of the jacuzzi? No, 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 not picture of the jacuzzi. Um, where's my jacuzzi? Oh, there's a jacuzzi. Okay, here's a jacuzzi. All right. Um, they're in the jacuzzi. They got the drinks and, the, and she supposedly got some strawberries and some whipped cream. And they're going to have this lovely time. She claims they're in the jacuzzi for two hours. Now, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to have to ask you dudes. Would you sit in that jacuzzi for two hours straight? <laughs> I don't know. I can't, come, I can't say anything about somebody else. But, you know, after about 50 minutes, I, turn, I start wrinkling into, a, you know, it's like, oh, God, I've turned into a wrinkly thing. And I want to get the hell out of there. Uh, you know, I've been in better jacuzzis outside you know i was in one in uh 
Uh, I was in Puerto Rico in San Juan with my daughter. We were upstairs on the rooftop looking over San Juan and we had one and we sat in the jacuzzi. I'm going to say we maybe sat in the jacuzzi for, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Two hours is a long damn time. But with it, especially for guys, you know, I'm like, eh, I'm done with this. You know, her story changes as to what they actually did. First of all, she says that they were just in the jacuzzi for two hours talking about the future and their daughter, blah, blah, blah. Normal stuff. Later on, she'll say that they stay in the jacuzzi jacuzzi for an hour then they had sex and then they stayed another hour in the jacuzzi i'm not sure where they had the sex at but okay maybe they had it in the jacuzzi i don't know the story kind of changed but anyway the point about this is the timing issue and i'm going to get to all of this in a minute so you're going to see how this all plays out so she says originally that they got in the jacuzzi at midnight howl around for two hours so somewhere around 2 a.m in the morning was when this home invasion occurred, 2 a.m. in the morning. Well, according to what I just told you, they were home by 9.40. So there was no home invasion at 2 o'clock in the morning. If they went up to that jacuzzi, they were probably there by 10, 10 p.m., which makes more sense to me because I'm telling you, by 12, 12 a.m., you know, people are in their 50s, they're asleep. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, I can't do this. I mean, about 20 years old, and I, you know, you know, that really hot dude that was 20, 21 years old, maybe. But, you know, this is my husband, 32 years. I ain't staying up to 12 a.m., you know. So, and sitting for two hours in a jacuzzi and then having sex. And good God. Okay. But to each their own. Maybe they're different than me. So, but if they got home at 940, they were not waiting two hours and 20 minutes to get the jacuzzi. And the reason they didn't do that is because she didn't say, we cleaned up the house, we... We did all these other things, and then we got in the jacuzzi. She said, we got our drinks, got some strawberries and cream, and went to the jacuzzi. So I'm going to say, you were there at 10 p.m. If you were there at 10 p.m., and this home you were sitting there entirely for two hours, which I entirely don't believe either. But, okay, if you were, then by midnight, this home invasion occurred. Now, this is really, really important because of what's going to happen next. All right. So at midnight... I'm going to say at midnight because I don't think the 2 a.m. makes any sense. I'm going to go, I'm going, I'm going to give them the two hours. So you're going to say you are just a happy little couple. You like to talk about stuff and your husband doesn't mind being in a jacuzzi for two hours. Great guy. All right. So now it's midnight. Supposedly there's a home invasion. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the home invasion issue. Sandra says the doors were locked, including the garage doors. But all the doors were locked. See this open door? That was what the family found the next day. That was not the way it was that night. They always locked their doors. It was also locked from the inside. So it wasn't like you could open up from the outside. You had to only open from the inside. So this was the state of the house when they returned home. They also had four barky little dogs, little yappy things. You know, they had a doggy door, so the dogs go in and out. But there were four tiny little dogs that were yapping their little brains out. Now, supposedly Sandra says they were in the bathtub having this lovely jacuzzi time. The dog started yapping. So Jaime said, let me go move the dogs because I don't want them to piss off the neighbors. I'm going to go downstairs and move them to another location, which I'm not sure I even understand that, but okay, fine. So he supposedly goes downstairs to move the yappy little dogs. Now here's the point. If there are yappy little dogs, and it's, it's a, let's say it's 2 a.m. in the morning and you want to, you're going around the neighborhood. You know, you're your home invader. Do you pick a house with two, there's, there's two vehicles. One is in the garage and one is outside the garage. There's somebody home. On top of that, the doors are all locked and there's freaking yappy little dogs there. Is that the house you're going to pick to invade? And my answer is no, that's probably not happening. What the heck are we, would you be doing that for? But okay, this is the story that, that Sandra gives. That he went, Jaime went downstairs uh, in just a towel to check, to move, move the dogs, to do something about the dogs. Now, mind you, here's something else that drives me crazy about this case. Everybody says, and I'm telling you, everybody, even the prosecution, okay, they, they got in the tub somewhere around 2 a.m. in the morning. This, Sandra says the dogs are barking and Jaime went downstairs. How do you know that Jaime went downstairs? He's not around to say he went downstairs. 
Who said he ever went downstairs? Maybe Sandra went downstairs and picked up a kitchen knife on the way back upstairs. I mean, oh, sorry, sorry. It wasn't, I, mean, I take that back. There's no downstairs. I'm sorry. Um, let, me, let me fix that for you. Okay. I, ju I just, I didn't mean to say downstairs. Let me, let me show you. Let me show you the house layout because that was unfair of me to do that. Okay. This is the house layout. You'll see right in front, it says uh, front entrance. It's actually like a one-story house mostly. There's a garage over that, like, you know, that's that you can get into that garage if you already, if the door is open. Um, and then there's a kitchen there, a living room there. And then if you go, if you look toward the uh, right side, you'll see at the top, you'll see the master bedroom. Okay. That's where they were hanging out. There's also, you can see if you go up very, very top, you'll see that there's a place that's, that's the jacuzzi and there's a closet in there. And that's where she was found, bound and tied up. And if you look back in the bedroom, you see, you'll see, you'll see a bed. And then you'll see next to the bed, a chair, and then you'll see a closet. And that's where he was found. That's where his body was found. So it's really actually just one, one, one floor. So he left the bedroom. Uh, sorry. He left supposedly the jacuzzi and went out to where the dogs were yapping around and, and, and tried to do something about them. Okay. That's what he did. So actually he didn't go downstairs. He just went to where the dogs were, but that's her word. And nobody says, Hey, <laughs> How do we know he did that? She could have gone to where the dogs were and gone to the kitchen and got a knife because the knife appeared to be from the house, not from an outside source. The knife that killed Jaime, that stabbed him. Let me see. Let me, let me pull up exactly how many times he was stabbed. He was stabbed. Um, uh, let's see. He was stabbed, I think, 32 times. Uh, he was stabbed 32 times and he was bludgeoned, Okay. And he was found in his closet. I'll get into all that in a minute. I'm just trying to sort of break you through the, the way it all played out. So she's saying that they, they went to the jacuzzi, had this nice time, and he went, the dog sparked, and he went to check on the dogs. And he, while he was gone, and again, first of all, we don't even know they went into the jacuzzi. And it drives me crazy that everybody's saying, well, they got in the jacuzzi. How do you know they even used the jacuzzi? We don't know that. She says they got in the jacuzzi. She's the only one alive to say that. They may never have even gotten near a jacuzzi. We don't know. Maybe something else happened at 940 at night. And then jacuzzi has nothing to do with anything. So don't believe something because somebody says it, unless it's proven. There's no proof. Was there water in the jacuzzi? Yes. But there were also, the knife was in the jacuzzi too. So, hey, you know, maybe somebody's just trying to wash the damn thing. There's no proof either one of them was in the jacuzzi. That is Sandra's word for it. She may be telling the truth, but we just don't know. Then she says that Jaime went to do something about the dogs. We also don't know that that is the truth. Uh, we don't know that anybody checked on the damn dogs, or maybe Sandra went to the dogs. And maybe that's just an excuse for why. Uh, who knows? But there's no proof of that. Anyway, the next part of the story is Sandra says she was in the jacuzzi. And... Jaime took a while to come back. Now her story changes from like 20 minutes to 15 minutes to five minutes. And people make a lot of this like, you know, hey, she changed her story. The police made a lot of it. She changed her story. I'm not that big on that because, you know, she, she had had supposedly a seizure. So her mind was not working totally well. So maybe she didn't know her timing. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm even okay with the fact that maybe she came home at 940 and at 10 o'clock they went to the jacuzzi and not midnight. I, I don't know about her brain. I just want to point out the time issues, not that she was right or wrong about it, but I'm going to say at the most 12 o'clock was when the last thing could have happened. Okay. So at midnight at the most, um, she claimed that Jaime didn't come back. So she got out of the tub. Now here's a very interesting thing she says, which also is one of those things that I don't understand why nobody's talking about. She says she went to get changed. She, now, they, they each had a closet. He had a closet in the bedroom where he'd go into the closet. All his clothes were in there. That was like his thing. And he could sit on his stool and put his shoes on and change up. She had a closet that was in the the uh, the, uh, the 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 master master bathroom. And it was a closet where she had her things and she could, she could sit down and take care of herself. She says she went in there and sat down and started putting on uh, lotion and stuff. And she said she changed now, I have a problem with this because when I get out of a tub or out of the shower and I'm naked and wet, I don't change into anything. I put on something. I get out of the tub. I don't have a tub. 
I get out of the shower and I put on a robe. I get out of the shower, I dry off and I put on clothes. I don't change because there's nothing to change from. What do you change from a naked person to a non-naked person? Changing is when you have clothes on and then you put on other clothes. She said this quite a few times that she changed. She tried it a couple of times. She said, oh, I put, she tried to stumble back and change what she said. But she said, I changed, I changed. So my question is, if she changed, was she ever in the jacuzzi? Or did she come home from her, from the restaurant in her regular clothes and change into a nighty? And she, she, she was, later on, I'll show you the pictures of this. Let me show you right now. All right, she was, she was, after this all occurred, she was, she was seen, and this was the outfit she was found in. Mm -mm -mm. Where'd it go? Hello. Where are you? Okay, hold on a second. The the pictures are so bloody tiny, you have to really work hard to see them. And no, it cannot possibly be missing. Hold on a second. So every once in a while, for some reason, um, which I've had problems with before, are you kidding me? I put these things in here and I have had them go missing prior to the show. I do not understand how this can even happen because I know I put them in here and this is going to be very upsetting to me if they're not here. And I'm not seeing them. It's like they vanished. How is this possible? This has happened before and I don't understand it. Wow. How weird is Okay, I'm going to look again. Um, this is so strange and I'm going to be very upset because this is a very important part of what I want to say. Um, what in the world? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm going to change some of my backgrounds. I'm trying to find out. Wow. It's absolutely missing. Um, how, how bizarre is that? Um, I am very upset about that because it was here um, and now it's, it's, it's gone and I can't, I don't think, I, well, maybe I can get it back in the middle of a show. Let's see if that happens. I've never tried this during the middle of a show. Ooh, let me see if I can get it back. Hold on a second. Well, that's interesting. Huh? Okay. Let's try this. Oh, maybe it's going to work in the middle of a show. All right. <laughs> it's here. Okay. I, I, it, it disappeared on me. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, here she is. After she was found, and I'm going to go back and explain this whole thing, but I just want to explain the clothes she supposedly got into. She, if you see, uh, you see a black robe. It's a thin black robe, and below that black robe, you'll see a little red, and that is her nighty, and she had socks on her feet. Her claim was she went into the closet after she got. He was Jaime was away, look with the doggy thing, and she got out of the jacuzzi. And while she was waiting for him, she went into her closet, put on some lotion. And then she put on her nighty, her her robe, and those socks, not the pants. Those apparently were put on after she was found so she wouldn't have to walk around the street naked. Okay? Okay. This is going to be very important in a little bit. Anyway, whoops, let me get rid of that background because that's not supposed to be there. Okay. <clears throat> I'll get to that in a bit. Wait till you see that. That's going to be my crime reconstruction. Okay. So let me go back to... Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. So, okay. So she gets out of this. She goes into this closet. This is her closet. You see the floor there? That's how she's in the closet. She's putting on some lotion, but she says she changes. So my question is, when you say change, it sounds more like to me you came home from CVS, you had regular clothes on because you went to a restaurant and you changed into your nighty and you're put on a robe and some, maybe you had, maybe you had the socks on your feet already. Maybe you didn't, but you're kind of getting ready for bed and you're coming, maybe wandering around a bit. You change from clothes to clothes. You don't change from naked to clothes. You put on clothes. So that's an odd thing that she said, but we'll get to what that might mean. So anyway, she says she went into this closet, did this, and then this is where it all gets so weird. At that point, she says she knew nothing more, that the next thing she knew, she was on the floor of that closet. She woke up from what she thought might have been a seizure because she felt like she couldn't move very much. And after seizure, sometimes your body is kind of like, like, you know, it's, it's one side won't work real well or whatever. She woke up and then she just went back to sleep. The next thing she heard was the dogs barking and her husband's family had arrived at the home. 
and they, they were supposed to come for dinner. Now, let me tell you about the time frame. So this is what gets so bizarre. And it's, it's really hard for me to try to explain this and make it make sense. Supposedly, now I'm telling you, it's 12 midnight at the latest. Midnight, supposedly there's a home invasion. Some guy, some people came in. They somehow, maybe they hit, she was in the closet and they hit Sandra over the back of the head and knocked her out. Maybe she had a seizure and they said, oh, look, she's already had a seizure. Let me tie her up. I don't know. But she's in the closet. They kill Jaime with his 32 stab wounds and bludgeoning. And then they leave. And uh, the family doesn't show up in the morning. We're talking about 12 a.m. The family is due to come to celebrate their wedding the very next day at 4. They're coming for dinner. They arrive at the house at 4.30 p.m. They're going to they're gonna come there. They're, they're different things are going to get all ready. I guess they're having dinner maybe 5, 6 o'clock dinner time. They're going to have a big celebration. They come at 4.30. They find that, they find that, remember that issue about the door? They find that door open. I'll get into that in a bit too. They find the door open and they're like, what the heck? They're, they seem to be home, but why aren't they answering the doorbell? So they go in and they don't find anybody there until they hear help, help from, from the, the from the uh, master ba bathroom. And then they go in there and they, they hear the noise coming from that closet. And they find that a chair has been has been pushed up against the the door has been pushed up against the doorknob. They pull that chair away, open the door, and there is Sandra lying on the floor, bound hand and foot on the floor. Okay, she claims that she knows nothing about what happened, that she never heard Jaime come back from the dog thing. She never heard any screaming. She never saw it. Nothing. She didn't hear any home invasion people. She didn't hear any problem. Now, mind you, let's let's look. Let's take a look at the picture of where they're at in the house. This is actually is that, no. Let me look. Show you this. Okay, she's in that master bathroom. He's in the master bedroom. You see the two closets. He is eventually found dead in the, the closet at the bottom of the screen. She's found tied up in the closet at the top of the screen. That is very, very close. She's claiming that she's getting lotion on in that closet at the top of the screen. And he's being stabbed 32 times and bludgeoned and put in, in the closet right, like, like right around the corner. And she hears nothing and knows nothing. That's what she claims. She claims that she, let me go back to our, uh, her closet here. She claims that the last thing she remembers Hold on a second, I gotta find it. Not wrong one. Okay, she claims she's she is in this closet. Now her husband's in this closet. She's in this closet, laying on the floor. The last thing she remembers is putting on the lotion, and then she wakes up on the floor, and she says she can't move much. She doesn't seem to say her hands are bound or her feet are bound. She just says she wakes up and goes, "Oh, maybe I had a seizure," and then she goes back to sleep. When she wakes up the next time, she hears the dogs barking because his family has arrived at 4.30 the following afternoon, 16 hours later. And they go in and they they, they pull away the, the chair and they find her in the bathroom. And then they find Jaime murdered in his closet. She's been in the bathroom for 16 hours. All right. Now here is where I start losing my mind. Because... There's a lot of weird things about this case. The police, one of the things the police say is that they suspected her right away because of her odd demeanor that she didn't seem to cry much about her husband being dead. And when they looked at the, um, looked at the house, they did not see, let's see if I can pull this up. No, that's not it. Okay. Hold on a second. Now that one's, is that one gone too now? Well, I'm having a weird, this is so weird. Where is it? Okay. Hold on a second. Hmm. I'm having a strangest, you know, I had this problem before and I, I don't, don't understand what happens. Huh? Well then. Okay. So still don't understand it. I'm losing, I've lost a bunch of pictures. There were drawers pulled out in the house, but they weren't ransacked. They, you know, when usually when people are, are burglarizing a place, they pull out drawers, they throw them, they toss things, they look for stuff. None of that happened. It's like somebody just went like this. It didn't look like a real burglary. They didn't see that there was anything really stolen. So they're like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this. It doesn't look like a home invasion. Why would somebody come in the house, not really take much, and then murder this guy, and then tie her up in the bathroom? 
Okay, so, but they find her in the bathroom 16 hours later. And I keep pointing out the 16 hours because nobody else does. They say this. This is what all the innocence project type people do. This is what everybody wants to find her innocent. I'm not saying she's not, but I'm just saying this is just weird to me. People who've had grand mal seizures will defend her to the end of the earth. She had a grand mal seizure. You know, she 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 didn't know what happened. And then you know, your memory gets sketchy and she, you know, she she woke up and there she was tied up. She couldn't help her. You know, she couldn't, you know, she had a grand mal seizure. Well, when you have a grand mal seizure, you're not asleep for 16 freaking hours. You have a grand mal seizure, you go out for a while, maybe a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and then you're you awake. Sometimes you get tired and sleepy. You might you might doze back off for a couple of hours. Not 16 hours. 16 hours. Come on now. Nobody has a grand mal seizure, just doesn't recover for 16 hours straight and doesn't know where they are for 16 hours. So in a closet for 16 hours. Now, she says when she woke up, now. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, she supposedly is lying on her face with her hands behind her back and her feet tied. That's the most freaking uncomfortable position ever. If you wake up for even a reasonable amount of time, you got to say, what the heck is wrong? You know, I can't move. Oh, my God, I'm tied up in a closet. And then even if you're a little disturbed somewhere in that 16 hours, you should say to yourself, what happened to my husband? What happened? And you should start screaming for your husband and you start whacking on the door and trying to get out. She doesn't say she did any of that. When she talks to the police, she just says she doesn't know what happened for 16 hours. She doesn't say, I, I woke up and I couldn't believe. I'm like, oh my God, you know what? If I'm tied up in the closet, where's my husband? I tried to get out of the ties. I tried to get out of the door. She doesn't say anything. She says, I just remember nothing for 16 hours. And most people don't realize it's 16 hours. They think, oh, there's a few hours. No, 16 hours. 16 hours is not rational. Then there's this, this very interesting point where after she's found in the closet, I, I looked I looked all over the internet trying to find out about urinating and defecating. You, If you have a grand mal seizure, a lot of times you urinate and defecate because your body just goes, right? Or if you've been in a closet for 16 hours after you've been drinking, you're probably going to pee yourself. I mean, that's just normal. And I look and I can't find anything in any of the records. Now, I want to point out something here. When you are not involved in the case, I couldn't get hold of the police reports. I couldn't, I got, I got, you know, stuff on video that was all edited and clipped to so say half the time you didn't know it was even true. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing with not getting all the facts. So just be aware of that. So when I say something, I'm going to say, because I couldn't find the facts as a person outside the case, but I couldn't find anything about urinating and defecating on herself, which I thought was an interesting point, at least for somebody who was tied up for 16 hours. The only place I found it, I found one little place and it seemed to come from the brother-in-law, but way after the fact, like somewhere after during the, all the documentary stuff, he said that. But here, here, take a look at this. Okay, go back to it. This is why I want this picture. Now I know I can at least fix things while I'm, okay. See her, she's in what she claims she put on before she went in that room. She has on a, a nightie, a black robe, and those socks. Now I looked at those very carefully, close up. I see no stains on anything. Now I'm gonna say, if you're lying on that closet floor, peeing and crapping yourself, you're gonna be in a puddle of mess. You are gonna have a, a stains on your 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 nighty stains on your 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 robe, and you might you might have pee in your socks because you know. Pee goes, pee expands. You know, you pee and it goes all over the place and then there, it goes in your clothing. Now, there's when later on when she's sitting there talking to the cops and the, she's in, in the interview, she's getting in the interview room, she's perfectly calm there. She's not saying like, I stink like, I'll get out. I don't want to, can I get out of these clothes? I smell. The cops don't seem like they notice that she smells. And this is really odd statement that later on, the one of the police officers who's a little questionable um, had her socks in his drawer. I'm like, would you put some stinky socks in your drawer if there were urine on them? I don't think so. So I'm not seeing the urine at all. I'm not seeing urinating and defecating here. I, so I'm wondering, you're 16 hours in a closet and that didn't happen? Maybe it did, but I can't see it here. I find that very, very odd. I just do. I find it very odd. Now, maybe there's some information that I'm missing, but I don't see stains on the floor. I don't see stains on their clothes. And I don't understand how you can do 16 hours 
and be hit over the head possibly and and also possibly have a scramble or seizure and get through 16 hours without peeing. I'm sorry, I just find that a little weird. So we have supposedly 16 hours in the closet. And the reason this is so important is it's possible, if she's not telling the truth, she was never 16 hours in the closet, that she might have just been an hour in the closet. She might have known they were coming at 4.30 in that afternoon. She had the entire night, the entire morning, and half the afternoon to stage a crime scene. She could have opened drawers up, figured out stuff. She could have washed up stuff, whatever. Now, they claim that, now, he was stabbed. Now, let's let, see, see over here, he was stabbed 32 times and bludgeoned. And so one of the questions people have is, how did this woman do that? I mean, she was, you know, she supposedly had lupus. She supposedly had epilepsy. She supposedly had two hip replacements. And they show her with that, that cane, but don't buy that because she actually stumbled on that and said, well, I only use a cane once in a while when I need to. <laughs> so I'm not sure she actually uses the cane as much as she did after the fact of this murder. Um, how sick, how wimpy was she? Now, you got to understand, Jaime was only 125 pounds. That was a little dude, <laughs> a really little dude. He was on a juicing project. He was a little dude. He wasn't a weight, uh, you know, bodybuilder. Um, she was actually bigger than he was uh, and had more weight than he had. I I'm not saying, you know, usually women can't fight men that well. Men fighting for their lives, you think that he would win. But I don't know. How much did he have to drink before this happened? There was some claim that she might have tied him up in a chair, told him, hey, we're going to have some sex fun because he was found with some these ties around his um, around his feet. Let me find that. Um, if that didn't disappear on me. <laughs> Since everything seems to be disappearing. What in the world? Very interesting. Okay, wait a minute. It's got to be here. Mm -mm -mm. Hold on one second. I swear to God, there's something There's something so fishy happening. Anyway, this is the closet. This is, the. I think, the stool that was supposedly in his closet that he that he was killed in that area. And uh, the, the theory is, is, there's two different theories. The defense said he was backed into the closet by some home invaders. And then blood spurted out on this chair. And the prosecutor says that he was actually sat on this chair for some sex play because there was some these these um, cords found around his feet, and and it, you know and so maybe that there was sex play and that he was restrained before this happened and therefore you know therefore <laughs> you know he couldn't quite fight back. Now I don't know. He could have had too much to drink. He could have, and I don't know what the alcohol level was. I looked that up. And sometimes if it's been a long time and they don't check it properly, you may not know if they've had a lot of alcohol. He could be kind of, kind of out of it. Um, he could have been tied up par partially. And that's why as a female, she could attack him. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was just such a surprise attack. He, you know, he did get, have defense wounds, but maybe by that time he did the defense wounds, he wasn't all that strong. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like an odd crime for, for a female to commit against her husband like this. But then again, there's no evidence of anybody else being in the house. Um, there, there, there's no evidence truly of a home invasion that, that anybody could have gotten into the house, that they left any evidence that they were in the house. Now there's claims, there's claims by the defense, of course, that they didn't, didn't do proper DNA stuff and all that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is true. Um, so anyway, she, um, she so these are the claims she makes that uh you know that she was in that uh the closet for 16 hours straight now the biggest problem with this case which is why everyone thinks she's innocent is because she was tied up in the closet and that's just true her hands were tied behind her back her feet were tied and there was a door that was stuck up underneath the the doorknob and let me show you where that is here see if i can find it uh, again, I'm hoping uh, more things haven't gone missing on me. Okay, let's see. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, by the way, these are the these are the things that tied her up. The the blue one is the one that tied her ankles, and the purple one is the one that tied her hands. Now, now her, the door was supposed to this chair, and the, let me see if I can find it. Okay, see that chair, the white the white chair there with the that was supposedly stuck up under the doorknob, so pushed under the doorknob to prevent the door from being opened. And you can't, you know, normally you do that if you're trying to, you know, keep somebody out. In other words, if you're at home alone, you're female at home alone, you don't have a good locking system, you can take a chair and shove it up underneath the uh, the, uh, the doorknob, wedge it under there. And that will prevent somebody from opening the door because the, 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 the feet of the, the feet of the chair will stick in the ground and, and it acts like a lock. Um, 
That's what happened. Usually somebody else does that, not the person inside. The claim by the, the prosecution is that she, they, they, so they showed how you could take a, a chair, put it underneath, and they're saying that she used this, this pillow sham and she put it underneath the chair feet and pulled the chair. In other words, she got it right up against the door and then she put that under, she had it under the feet of the chair and she pulled it and then that jammed the door. And then she pulled that into the closet. Now they claim that that was not in the closet when they got there, but that's not actually, see, see there it is outside the closet. Well, if she was coming out of the closet, she could easily kick that forward and it would just no longer be in the closet. Now you might ask, is that even possible that you could do what she said she did? Um, that could she have done that herself? Is she, you know, brilliant like that? Okay, here's my chair. That's my chair up against that. I did that. And do you know what? I could do that. I did it with a pill. I did it with a pillowcase and it was easy as pie. I couldn't believe how quickly I was able to do that. Like in seconds, I'm like, wow, who knew that was that easy. I mean, obviously I didn't do it against my bedroom door because I wanted to get out of my bedroom, <laughs> but I did do a practice run with it under my, you know, and I, I pulled it so I could see if I could pull the, the, then I could pull the case out from underneath the chair and I could. Uh, so that was, it's, it's doable. Um, so she could have done that indeed. Now, now it's interesting. The, 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 the brother-in-law was the one who, who originally pulled the chair away when he arrived at the home. And then he says, you know, I pulled the chair away and he claims later that there was no pillow sham under it, that there was, it was against the floor. Uh, and that may be true because you can pull the pillow sham out right into the closet. And then when you leave the closet, kick the, the pillow sham right back into the uh, bathroom. So, you know, nobody knows you had it in the closet. Now people say, oh, how brilliant that is, but it's not really rocket science. Um, but then he says this, and this is where things get really crazy. And this is where it bugs me that nobody has ever tried this. Now, the prosecution said, okay, wait a minute, I got the prosecution. The prosecution says her hands were supposedly the brother-in-law comes in, he finds her lying on her face on the ground. Her feet are tied and her hands are tied behind her back. Originally, he says her hands are tied behind her back. Later, he tries to change it to, and this is this is from um, uh, uh, a podcast, and that's also, that's a link to below. Um, this fellow is a big guy for, um, oh, what's, what's his name again? Let me, let me pull up his name. Um, he does his, it's very interesting podcast. I find that he tends to, He's an Innocence Project guy, so I'm not sure I believe in a lot of what he says. But he, um, no, I can't find it. Uh, Ruff, his name is Ruff. Um, he does Truth and Justice podcast. It's it's linked in it's linked below in the uh, uh, in the YouTube video. You'll see when you go to the YouTube video I put below, you can click on it. You'll find his links to his podcast. Very interesting stuff. He claims, oh no, see, it was actually her arms that were tied together, not her hands. And he makes a big deal of this. Like this would this would prove that she couldn't have done it herself. All right. So now you're going to ask me, could she have done it herself? Could she have tied her own hands herself behind the back? Now, what happened was when this happened, let's see if I can find my other one I want to put up here. Seriously. Okay, here we go. Okay. This, the purple thing is the one that tied her hands behind her back. It looks like this. This is the prosecutor trying to prove that she did it herself. The claim is when the brother-in-law came that that was so tightly tied, he could not untie it. And she told him to get the scissors and cut it off of her. This sounds like, well, if that's true, the woman is innocent as hell, totally innocent because she can't, if, she, if he couldn't even untie it from her, you know, she couldn't have done it herself and he had to use scissors to cut it. Well, first thing that attracted my attention was the fact that the scissors were right there in the bathroom where she could shout out, Get the scissors and cut this off of me. Now, remind you, when when her brother-in-law comes in the house, they're already panicked. They open up the door. They find her tied on the floor. They're not going to be paying attention to very many things. And she's got her hands behind her back. She's screaming, I can't get to get the, cut them off of me, cut them off of me. And he's, he's like, oh, okay, get the scissors. I don't know how much time he spent trying to figure out if he could actually get them off of her. So, you know, she could have basically manipulated him into thinking they were tied super tight. And all you have to do is pull your hands really tight. And it seems like they're tied and go get the scissors and cut them off. And then he believes he did that. And that's because he couldn't take them off. Now, I want to do a little demonstration for you. And I'm going to be try to be careful about, hold on a second. Let me get a drink in case this fails. I, I did this last, I did this last night. I'm not going to show you behind my back. Last night, what I did was I took this robe tie 
this rope tie and I did this. Let me show you what I did. This is now normally when I do crime scene reconstruct, uh, some kind of reconstruction thing, I have a, what's called a spotter. I say, can you come in here and watch me when I do this? So in case I die, you know, I'm dying. You can like save me. Like if I'm, pretend, if I'm trying to test hanging myself, you know, I, I want a spotter. I don't, I don't want to act. Eh, and nobody's there to go, oh, we'll get you off of this. Well, I'm thinking this isn't dangerous, right? So I don't need a spotter. So I'm home alone. And I do this with my hands, right? I got these things. I go behind my head like this and I start tying my arms up. <laughs> I've never done this before. I've never tried to tie my arms when I have before. I did. I wanted to tie my arms and not my hands. So I, I worked really hard at that, making sure that I tied it on my arms. <laughs> I got stuck. I'm like, holy crap, I can't get my arms up. <laughs> I, I could not do it. I couldn't get my arms out. I'm like, oh my God. And then I'm standing in my house going, what do I do? My arms are behind my back. Luckily, I didn't tie my feet. But I'm like, I hope I can open the doorknob and get out of my house. I hope I can like put my nose on the phone and call my daughter and tell her to come down here and get me out of this stuff. So anyway, it's supposed to show you in five minutes. I did it so well that if somebody had come in, they would have they would have absolutely thought that. Now I'm going to try to do this in front of in in the front, so at least I can theoretically move my hands more. But I just want to show you how easy it is to fool people. Okay. okay. Now, this looks like, oh, this is this is around, okay, this is around my hands. Okay, he wanted arms, okay. So Bob Ruff who claims it was definitely around her arms and I don't know that it even was around her arms. Let's move this up. Let's move this up around my arms because I, I want you to, I want to be fair. Okay, let's move this around my arms and not my hands. Although I don't know what it makes any difference. All right. All right, so, okay, hold on a second. I, wanna, I gotta move this further up, further up here, further up there. Okay, now, now this is, this is just done quickly. Now, this is in front of me. Do you see, see how I'm struggling right here? Now, now I actually did get out, but I can, you know, all you do is practice this a couple times because, uh, you know, it takes, sometimes you gotta, you know, she could have done a better tie than I just did. Let's see, I'm going to put a knot on this one. It's really, I mean, it, it, you know, she had 16 hours, in my opinion, to figure this crap out. But, you know, she could be, all she needs is a, oh, come on a second, let me, let me work on this. Okay, let me, let me do one on more on my arm. Okay. I'm doing a double knot now, so I'm going to get stuck here and not be able to do the show because I won't be able to touch it. Okay, this is double knotted. Okay, so I'm gonna pull this one over here, put this one through here. Okay, now this is just a quick example. And I, you know, if I pull like this, you you aren't gonna be able to get that crap off of me. Look at this. Uh, uh, uh. She's got this behind her head. She's saying to him, I can't, uh, uh, and cut it off of me. And he looks at this and he's like, I, I, I can't see where the knots are. Of course he can. Because it's the knot. I don't even know where the knots are here. And he goes and gets a scissors and cuts it off. And it looks like she couldn't have done this herself. I did it in five minutes. I put the door, the, I wedged the, the the chair under the door in five minutes and pulled it, pulled the sham out from under it. Arms, I don't care. Arms, hands, I don't care what you say. Rough. It looks pretty damn good. I hope I can get out of this shit. Okay. I can get out of this. But but see, he wouldn't, the brother-in-law wouldn't know that. She's lying on her face. And she's, she's, she's all hooked up like that. She's saying, get the scissors, get the scissors. So he cuts her out of there. And then she's like, oh, I'm free. And she runs and she runs and she she finds, they find her husband in the closet. And she she's, takes his pulse, which I thought was interesting um, because he's clearly dead. Um, and maybe she wanted to touch him, put her DNA there. I don't know. Anyway, she then, okay. She then, which is interesting to me, she states that after 16 hours, get this, get this. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to go through my list in a minute. Just see what I did. I missed. She's been on the floor theoretically for 16 hours. She supposedly has been hit over the head. She claimed she has a, something on her head. 
and and her head hurts. And she supposedly thinks she's had a seizure that put her out for 16 hours. She doesn't want medical attention. Why not? Wouldn't you want to know what happened to you? Wouldn't you want to know if you have some, some in, injury? Wouldn't you want a CAT scan at that point? Because if you go to the hospital and ask for help, they're going to, get, they're going to do a CAT scan right away. She doesn't want that. Instead, after, I think it's like five hours, she just goes to the police station and talks to them. And she talks to them in such a way that they become immediately suspicious because she says she remembers nothing. She has very little emotion about her husband being killed. And then when they ask her, what do you think happened? And I have the links below to the, in the interview. She goes, my husband was murdered. And, she, and then later on, she tries to go, mm -hmm. very unconvincing. And the, but the police were like, something's wrong with this picture. We don't see any sign of... A, breaking and entering. We don't see the signs of burglary. The woman's story is crazy. We don't, we, we don't like it. And so eventually she got arrested and she got convicted of this crime. Now, let me, let me point out a few other things. I'm just going to go through my list because I do have a list um, about all the things I question. Okay. Why was he killed and she was not? Why, why did they even bother to tie her up in the closet? I mean, why? Oh, by the way, I'll tell you something else interesting. So there's only one interview of her after, after um, in the prison, after she got convicted. And then that one interview, she says something very interesting. She says this, get this one. Remember, she couldn't, remember she couldn't remember anything from that night at all. At all. Mm. Are we kidding me? This is God again. Oh, Lord, I just haven't. No, don't be, don't be, don't be, don't be. She claims, she claims during that interview that she saw a young woman, an angry young woman looking at some guy, that some guy was behind her tying her up and there was an angry young woman staring at her. When she was being tied up in the closet by some man, an angry young woman was uh, staring at her. She didn't say this to the police. She says this after she's been convicted, like her memory is coming back now. Really? Is that true? And now you remember being tied up. So that is in the link below as well. Uh, and what's interesting about that is she actually said that in her interview, but it is it is edited out of the interview. If you actually see, there's two interviews. One has it in and one has it out. And I can't find the one that had it in. But the, the, the main show that was done about the case, they edited it out at that point. Because they're probably like, oh, that makes her look guilty. So they edited it out. So... But now she suddenly remembers. But anyway, why was he killed and she was tied up? What, what, what was the point? Why was nothing much taken? Well, nothing, they really didn't see much of anything taken. But then the police found an old backpack with an ex, an old backpack, which was their daughter's old backpack, in the garage with, in, had an Xbox and some jewelry in it. So now they're claiming that, oh, you see, she was burglarized. The guys took the backpack, but some reason got like scared or something and dropped it in, in the garage. Or did she just put some things in a backpack and try to make it look like something had been stolen? Um, well, here's a question I have. Okay, so the husband goes down and check on those doggies, right? According to her. And, no, sorry, not down. He went over. I keep thinking it's a two-story two house. Okay, he goes over in the house to the toward the front door to check on the dogs. And he confronts, at this point, I guess the, the killer, the, the future killers are in there. The home invaders are in there. If you were that guy, would you go back to where your wife was? Or would you try to stop them from going anywhere near your wife? But no, he goes straight back into the bedroom. Really? Okay. Why would he not yell out a warning? Remember, she's still okay. She's putting on lotion in her closet. She never hears him yell out, watch out, honey. Bad guys are in the house. Or call 911. Call the police. You know, whatever. He doesn't yell out. If she had a seizure prior to anyone coming coming in, if she already had the seizure, why would they even come into the bathroom? She's in a closet in the bathroom. Who gives a shit if she's in a closet in the bathroom? Who would even look in the closet in the bathroom? And then, if they were just there for the drugs, why didn't they trash the living hell out of the bathroom looking for drugs? All right. The other thought could be, some people have suggested, that she could have, when they were in the supposedly in the jacuzzi that she went to check on the dog, she might've just gone in and let somebody else in to commit the crime. And then he tied her up. I don't know if there's any evidence of that. I'm just saying people pointed that out. Uh, 
Let's see. She's very uninterested in who killed her husband. She is. She doesn't seem to give a crap. I mean, if somebody just killed my husband, one of my kids, anybody, I'd be going, who do this? Who would do this? I don't know. Who find her? You got to find these people who killed my husband. She doesn't seem to care. What? Oh, let, let's look back at the. Oh, let's look back at this. Let's look at what was in the tub. What was in the tub? I didn't get to this yet. All right. In the tub. See, see the tub right there. You will see there is a blouse a towel, and a knife. This is the knife that killed him, which looks like a knife from the kitchen. As far as we know, it is from the kitchen. It's in the bathtub. The killer killed, whoever killed Jaime threw the knife into the jacuzzi. But here's what I don't understand. See the blouse? The blouse had blood spots on it. And let me let me show you a close-up of that, if, if my picture stayed. Okay, let me show you a close-up of that blouse, because this is really weird. Um, well, what in the world is going on? That is so strange. I, yeah, I, I, nope. I've lost, I've lost like six pictures during this and I do not understand it. Yeah, they're gone. All the pictures are gone. That is so weird. I don't understand how, I don't know if there's some kind of weird, there are too many things and it just eliminates them. Huh. I will never forget. Okay, let me go back to the virtual background because uh, that's where it is. Okay, so over here, because I had a big picture of this, um, there's there's little red spots like this that go like this. They're like red spots all over here, little red spots, which look like the end of this. Like if you're stabbing and you have blood on the end of it, it's like you did this and you kept hitting the red spots on your blouse. There's red spots all over here, just like that, little round Little round one. And the blouse was put in the jacuzzi. Was the person who did this wearing this? Well, you would think, why else would there be a blouse in the jacuzzi? Except for the person where doing this was wearing this, which is why it leads me to believe they came home and something happened. And then she changed, as she said, she changed. She threw the blouse in the jacuzzi. She blew the knife in the jacuzzi. The, 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 the towel she might've been holding in her hand, she threw in the jacuzzi. Then she changed in her closet. That seems more likely to me. Um, now, the interesting, she says that one of the reasons she never heard what was happening was the jacuzzi was running this whole time. <laughs> she couldn't hear what was happening outside the bathroom. I don't understand. Was the jacuzzi still running 16 hours later when the family came? And they said they didn't find blood in any of the drains. Like, like they didn't figure, couldn't figure out how anybody could have washed up in the house. Well, there was blood on the knife in the jacuzzi. There was blood on the, the blouse in the jacuzzi. Maybe it was just in the jacuzzi for 16 hours. I don't I don't understand. If you ran the damn jacuzzi and the water swishing for 16 hours, would it eliminate all blood evidence? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I think that's kind of interesting. I also don't know whether they, did they ever check the washing machine and all that stuff. I don't know what they checked, but she could have gone outside and washed herself with a hose. I don't know. But I don't understand why the killers would leave a... what what. The, that girl that she says she saw, what, she ripped her blouse off and threw it in the jacuzzi and ran out naked? I don't think so. There's got to be reasons for these things. So I find this blouse extremely interesting. Let's see what else. She, she claimed that she usually breaks bones when she has a seizure. Is there evidence of this? Oh, which reminds me. I begin to wonder. She claimed she had lupus. She claimed she had epilepsy. A lot of the epilepsy, she went to the doctor for, for quite a while and hadn't had a seizure in forever. And even when she went to the doctor after the crime, she supposedly didn't mention having a seizure. I'm wondering how often she really had the seizures. Did she really have lupus? I know she supposedly had hip replacements, but I'm beginning to wonder if she Munchausen's. Does she get sick for attention? Constantly get sick for attention. Is this, a, is this an issue? And is this crime one more issue of attention? I don't know. Just pointing it out because I think it's odd. Um, let's see. Why didn't anybody gag her? You know, if you want her to, if you're tying her up in there, you don't want her to move or do anything. Why don't you just gag her too? So she can't scream out for help. If you're trying to just keep her from like, you might just be wanting to keep her uh, immobile so you can kill off her husband. But if you want to keep her from like calling the police or anything or screaming out, you know, if somebody comes in the house, you kind of prefer, why don't you just gag her? 
she wasn't gagged. And you know what? One of the reasons people don't do certain things is because it's too uncomfortable. <laughs> Just a thought. Um, all right, let's see. Why would a burglar come in with no bag to carry all this stuff away with? No weapon. Apparently, he didn't seem to have a weapon. And where there were barking dogs. Why would the burgl burglar leave the backpack in the garage? Like, let's see what else we got here. Um, Anything else I think of interest here? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, the, nobody ate, really ate the strawberries. <laughs> it's like, like two hours, they never touched the strawberries. She said she ate one. Okay. But the whipped cream is there. It's like nobody was dipping away. Um, well, let's see. Anything interesting here? Uh, I've got so many pieces of information. Okay, I, I'm going to stop here just because there's so much. It's like ridiculous. So I want I want to see what you have to say. And maybe some of those things that I've written down, like so many of them, you'll have commentary on. Okay, let me go look what you're saying because I've been away for a long time. There's 71 comments. <laughs> oh, Lord God. What? Why can't you see me? Oh, shoot. Did I leave a picture up? Oh, for God's sakes. When did I? Oh, no, 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 no. I did not do that. Did I? Did I? Did I? Can you see me now? Did I block you out? Oh, no, not again. Oh, I hope I didn't do that for terribly, terribly long. Oh, the ah, uh, how long has that been covering me? Shoot. Oh, you know, I have so much. Sometimes if you don't unclick this thing, it just ruins the whole thing. It just drives me crazy. Oh. Okay, um, you can't see me at all. Did you see me do? Oh, Lord, did I just mess this whole thing up? Uh, I tr ah, 441. What time is it now? Okay, I completely think I screwed this up. Oh, I completely. Did you see me do the, uh, okay, let me ask you a question. Oh, did you see me do the tying thing or did you not see that at all? I'm so depressed. Oh God, I left a picture up. I hate it. I hate these pictures that cover over because when I do that, you can't see me. Okay. Oh, thank you, Lisa. So, what the heck is this going on now? See, now, I can't, now nothing's working. Nothing's working here. Lisa says, oh, thank you, Lisa. She's, she's given some money to me too. Thank you, New Zealand 20. I asked for this case as I found it so confusing. I knew you'd make some sense of it. Can, okay, I saw you doing the tying thing. Oh, thank God. All right. <laughs> I don't know when that went all wrong. Saw the tire thing, missed the blood spatter thing. Mm. Oh, good. You saw the tire. The tying thing was the most important thing to me. But, you know, I say the, when you when you click on the, the, the overlays, if you don't click on them off, sometimes you don't realize they don't. I don't see them. So sometimes it's, I, it, it, it confuses me horribly. Um, oh. <laughs> but you saw me tying, which is important. Um, uh, let me, let, let, I'll just, I'll just, uh, what about that? You saw the tying thing. That was the most important thing. The blood spatter pattern. Um, uh, let me, let me just, let me just see if you didn't see that. There wasn't much. I mean, there's, um, let me, let me put the overlays on again and hopefully, basically this is the blood. It, the blood is on that stool, which was in his closet, this closet. See the blood spatters in the closet and in the closet also is a gun which they, is up on a shelf. And that, see, he looks like he see the blood on that, that um, pole. It's like he reached for the uh, gun and he, he, he didn't get to it. Um, and then there are some people who the claim is there's a little bit of blood on the on the safe handle and there's claims from the defense that they never checked out what whose DNA that was, whose blood that was. And that is concerning. Um, but he was clearly in the closet when he was stabbed a whole heck of a lot of times. Um, he was cornered in there. Um, and the question is, why was he cornered in there? Who did what to him? Um, the problem of this whole case comes down to this, that, let me see if I can read what you're saying. Um, the problem here is that, yes, could somebody else have committed this crime? Well, of course. Um, one would hope that somebody else committed this crime in the sense that it's hard to believe that this happily married couple of 32 years, the wife would suddenly on the 32nd anniversary stab him 32 times. That's kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, why would she do this? How could this diminutive woman with all these health problems and have a cane stab him like that? 
and then tie herself up, up in the bathroom and, and, and wedge a chair under the door. I mean, it seems outrageous. And that's why Kathleen Zellner is like, hot damn, this is why I'm going after this case because I'm going to make uh, making a murderer three. <laughs> I'm going to get another Netflix show out of this one. Um, but the problem is her story, Sandra's story, just doesn't make sense. And that's that's why, you know, when, police say, when people say, I don't know why the police, you know, why would they suspect Sandra so quickly? They just jump to conclusions. It's because the police have worked so many cases. And they're like, something's just not ringing right here. And I didn't, you know, I don't know what other police reports there were. I don't know what other interviews there were. Uh, what other things they discovered that they they maybe have said the same thing I did. Like she she couldn't have, it wouldn't have been 12 midnight. It would have to be about 10, 10 o'clock. Why is she two hours off? And if, if this happened at, by 12 midnight, how the hell was she in a closet for 16 hours and didn't know she was tied up? How does a grandma seizure last 16 hours? That does not make sense. And when something is so off, that is where you start going, this, this can't be true. It just can't be true. Um, you were fresh. I, 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 I'm really sorry if anybody's been here and, and you just saw, saw pictures over my face for like forever. I'm really sorry. Uh, uh that would be my fault uh, uh, that I, I forgot to click on something that removed the damn picture. Just drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> um, but that, that would be. But as long as you saw, I mean, I was most I was most worried about this demonstration because this, to me, is a huge key to this case, because so many have said she couldn't have tied herself up like that. She couldn't have tied her arms. It wasn't her hands. It was her arms behind her back. She couldn't have done it, and I did it in three seconds flat and couldn't get out of it myself. <laughs> it can be done. So if you don't, if you're unwilling to do a crime scene and. Uh, uh, reenactment, which is what I did. I'm like, you just keep saying, oh, she did this. This couldn't work. You didn't even try. Sorry, you didn't try. If you're the defense and you you didn't even try to do this crime scene reenactment, and then you have the gall to tell me she couldn't have done it, you're just lying. You're absolutely lying. She, A, could have tied herself up like that without a problem. She could have put the chair wedged under the door without a problem. I did both of them within a span of 15 minutes. I mean, I didn't even work that hard at it. She had 16 hours if she committed this crime. 16 hours to figure it out. That's a long damn time. Now, it's possible if she did defecate on herself or pee on herself, it's possible that she kept working out. She was in the closet trying to figure out how to do it. And then she figured out how to, she, she locked herself in and went, ah, oh, crap. I wasn't planning to do that for another eight hours. <laughs> No, I'm screwed. I'm stuck. You know, uh, darn it. And then she said, okay, I better, okay, I'll wait to tie myself up though. She might just been stuck in the closet, but then she's like, I gotta pee, I gotta pee, I gotta pee. Who knows? I don't know, but I don't see any of that evidence on her clothing when she was, you know, came out of the home. Uh, the EMT didn't say anything about that either. So I don't know. I honestly don't know if she actually had issues with that. Um, but that she could tie her arms behind her back and make it look and not be able to get out. I mean, it isn't even a matter of fact that she can make it by pulling, by pulling, you know, all you have to do is pull just, look, look how quickly I did that. Oh my God. Look at that. How quickly I just did that. Uh, uh, uh. And then this guy's like, I, I don't know. And you know, if you release your, if you relax your arms, of course you can get out. But as long as you don't cooperate, the guy is going to say, I can't get it off of you. And if you're telling him, get the scissors, I'm going to say he's going to get the scissors. He's trying to get you out of there. He's not going to be paying strict attention. Well, do you think she did that herself? He's not even thinking that way. He's just going to run and get, get the scissors, cut her off. And then he's going to say, see? So I proved it in 15 minutes that she could have done all of this herself. Now, I don't know if she did. I'm just saying she could have done it. And there's no evidence of an home and there's no evidence of home invaders there's no evidence of anybody burglarizing the place she her story is very strange she's changed her story too many times uh, little elements of her story 16 hours being unconscious is is, uh, is ridiculous i don't care if you've had a grand mal seizure you're full of crap you were not unconscious for 16 hours straight because at some point when you woke up and you found your arms really come tied behind your back like that as, as tight as she says that is damned uncomfortable. You're going to be flipping around like a little fish in there. You're going to be so miserable. 
you're going to be trying to get out of that. She didn't say, I was trying to get out of the damn things. I tried to move my feet. I tried to, I tried for an hour to move my hands and I couldn't get it done. And then I slammed against the door, hoping the door would open up. And I couldn't get the door to open up. She didn't say anything about that. 16 hours, she never said she even tried to get rid of her bonds or try to get out the door. All she says is, I woke up and heard the dogs barking and there was my, there was my in-laws and they saved me. But too late for Jamie. I'm sorry. It's really, really not making a lot of sense. I, I, you know, and, and this is one case. When I first saw it come up, I really thought, this is so bizarre. Finally, this is one case I'm going to go with. May, maybe this is a case where I believe the person was wrongly convicted. Wrongly convicted. And then I start looking at this case and I'm going, you know, and, you know, if I want to make friends, I should say she's wrongly convicted because I will now now get 100,000 new subscribers. But, I, I, you know, I, I found too many holes in the story that bother me that don't work. And so, yeah, it just doesn't work. So let me see what else you have to say here. Okay. Oh, I don't know what is this. Isn't this the weirdest thing? I, I'm putting these things. I, I'm seeing what you wrote. But when I put it on the screen, it comes up like this. Now look, what in the world is this nonsense? I'm going to read you what, what, what poor Molly actually wrote. <laughs> this, this, this is like a puzzle. Molly actually wrote, if her arms were tied that tight, there would be lots of marks, bruises, and maybe even their circulation cut off. You betcha. And that, oh, did I, oh, let me, did I show you the, uh, oh, I may have missed that. Um, the marks on her were this. Uh, this is, don't tell me this is gone again. I swear to God. Okay, here we go. Oh, this one is not gone. Thank God. All right. This, see over here? Those are the bruises on her arm. She had one more like little tiny red thing there. This is the bruise on her left bicep. This is what happened to him. This looks like somebody grabbed her arm. I don't see any evidence of all kinds of marks and bruising and abrasions on her arm from trying to get get out of those those things. I don't see a bit of that. Um, and that, again, is one of the concerns. Husband's been brutally stabbed and bludgeoned to death. She gets a bruise on her arm. Yeah. Um, yes, Col Colleen. Also weird stuff happening to all the words here. I don't know how I'm going to fix that. I never had that happen before. The husband was found with ties around his feet. Why would half the letters be missing? What is wrong with StreamYard? They're just out to get me. <laughs> Colleen says, the husband, yes, he was. But the interesting thing about that, they, the claim is, and again, I don't have access to the information to prove A or B. Supposedly, there, there were ties around his feet, but they looked like they were tied post-mortem. Like maybe like the person said, oh, you know, if I was tied, if I'm going to tie myself up, I better tie him up. So they put some some ties around his feet. Uh, that's one theory. Another theory is that the ties were there to keep him from being immobilizing him so that he could be stabbed to death by a, a, a small woman and not be able to fight back very well, which is also reasonable. But I, I can't tell that there are just two conflicting reports on their, whether it was post-mortem or pre-mortem, uh, you know, before he died. I don't know. Got, I got, got a question. I, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Oh, you don't see the letters missing? Huh. Because it says here, C, no, left, that's what it says on my end. <laughs> wow. That's it. Maybe Pat sees them only. What the heck? It's like pulled the guys. Do you know what I mean? Huh? Wow. Yeah, they're, they're missing on my end. So I, I, you know, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah, on, on this end, half the letters are missing. So I, I, I can only, I have to read what you say in the chat, but when I put it on the screen, I can't read it. <laughs> oh, that's craziness. Um, wow, that is funny. Let's see what else you have to say. Um, hmm. Now, this is interesting possibility. She thought, or maybe she thought somebody would come over here sooner. They, the family was scheduled to come at 4.30 p.m. for this dinner, okay? So one would think she knew she had exactly that amount of time. Um, she could have thought somebody was coming over sooner and then got herself into the situation that nobody showed up for like 12 hours. And then I was like, oh, crap. 
But I, I don't know if there's any evidence that she thought anybody should come over there sooner. But she definitely knew people coming up at 4.30 p.m. So the question is, did not did she do nothing until 3 o'clock, 3.30 p.m. and then get herself in place? I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But yes, she not only, well, I got, okay, I got, I got to go. Okay. She not only had 16 hours, but she also knew how much time she had. Yes. She knew when people are coming over, she knows exactly what she was working with. She would have time to clean and fix up and stage a, a burglary and get in the bathroom and all this stuff. She had a lot of time. Doesn't mean she did that, but yes, there was a lot of time to do that. And that's why it's so important to find out, did she defecate or urinate on herself? That's really kind of important. Um, could she have tied these things herself? That's very important because the whole point is if she couldn't have tied the ties herself, then she couldn't have committed the crime. It's, it's that simple. And they're claiming she couldn't have done it, but there's no proof of that. And that's what drives me crazy because it, it, is, it is wrong to claim she couldn't have done something she could have done. I just proved it. I mean, I proved it without even trying very hard. You can see it right here. I mean, I was shocked how easy it was. I'm like, huh, well, there you go. Because... I, and when I started looking at this case, I thought her story was strange, but I wasn't trying to prove her guilty. I was just saying, okay, I'm going to go through what she went through and see what makes sense. And I'm, I put my hands behind my back and did that. I went, oh, crap. <laughs> what am I going to do now? Because now I can't get my hands out from behind my back. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not that hard to put, to make it, to wrap up your arms behind your back. And those are my arms, not my hands, like they tried to claim. Uh, and I couldn't get out. And I'm like, it, I did eventually. But. All that, all that guy needed when he came and saw her on the floor was her just to pull the suspect to make it even appear harder. And then he just get the scissors and cut me out. So the fact that they're claiming that she couldn't have tied herself up is absolutely not true. And I wish they had pointed that out in the, in the they try to point out during the prosecution. But I thought, I personally thought the prosecutor was a little on the weak side. That's my theory on that. She just. <sighs> I mean, I'm surprised the jury found her guilty considering I thought the prosecutor kind of was not the best. Things are, things are, see, things are flying around again. Drives me crazy. Okay, let's see what else you have to say. Oh, okay. Sorry for this question, but could she have had a bunch of petite, pet, I never know how to say this, petite mall seizures? Petite malls have a bunch of shorter memory issues. Yes and no. Yes and no, but for 16 hours straight? Really? And it hasn't been documented prior to this. It hasn't been documented after this. Just at that exact moment, boom. Yeah. You know, this is, the, this is one of the things about the totality of evidence again. One can come up with, like, the most... You, you can always stretch the possibilities of something. Could somebody have gotten in her house and looked through all her drawers and not really tossed the place, not really, not really tried very hard to steal anything, but could they have come in and just sort of like, eh, gave up? Well, I guess they could have, but is that likely? And is it natural to then stab a guy 70, 32 times and bludgeon him in a home invasion? Not even bring a weapon? Is that logical not really i mean could it have happened it could have happened you know you can say anything could have happened but oh that's that remember that thing i said at the beginning this is that this is an important point where is that important point facts uh rational inference versus speculation speculation can be you can speculate anything you can literally speculate anything, uh, but that's not what that's not what investigation is about. It's not what prosecution is about. It's not what uh, coming up with a jury decision is about. Speculating anything. You can speculate aliens. I cannot prove aliens do not exist in this world. I can claim, or she could claim, I was tied up in the bathroom by aliens and they killed my husband. That's speculation. There's absolutely zero proof of that, but you can speculate anything you damn well please. But what was that term again? <laughs> Factual. Sorry. I'm not familiar with that term, so I, I like it. I like it, and I'm learning something here today. Um, where was that term again? Factual. Oh, no, sorry. 
rational inference, rational inference. I can rationally infer something from the evidence. So if I see some evidence that I rationally infer something, uh, irrationally inferring something would be saying like, uh, she was tied up in the bathroom. And so I rash, I can infer that aliens did it. <laughs> that's not rational inference. You know, that would make up. That's the speculation, making up crazy speculation. So uh, when you go to a court of law, oh, and by the way, I have below the link to the appeal. And it's very interesting. It's a very good link to the appeal of Sandra Melgar made to the state and has the defense people and has all the judges. And it's interesting how they go through the case and all the legal issues. And they point out these legal issues. That's where I got that uh, factual, factual uh, sufficiency review. That's what it's called, a factual sufficiency review. And then the big issue was rational inference versus speculation. Rational inference versus speculation. Um, so the point of, if you don't have, if you have a lot of circumstantial evidence, not a lot of absolute physical evidence, you have to do rational inference from that information, not just weird speculation. So I can rationally infer that if she left if she has a, if she has a, the CVS uh, receipt that says she left at 9.33, four minutes to her house as proven, four minutes to her house as proven by MapQuest or whatever I put up, pulled up there, um, Google Maps. She would be home by 9.40. That, that is actually pretty good evidence. And then I can What's the word for again? I'm sorry. This is a new. This is a new terminology for me. I don't usually use rational inference. I'm going to use it from now on. I can infer from the from the receipt that says 933 and the four minutes home, which will make 937. I can infer that they pulled up in front of the house and went in by 940. That's a rational inference. And because she claimed, Sandra claimed she then they went and got their drinks and went up to the jacuzzi right away. I can infer that they should have been in that jacuzzi by 10 p.m., not 11 p.m., not 12 a.m. I can rationally infer that. Now, what is speculation? Oh, you could speculate that for two hours, she forgot about those two hours because she had a seizure, and she forgot that for two hours they decided to play Monopoly. That's a speculation that's not based on anything that's rational. That's just making up crap. So that's the difference between rational inference and speculation. So... That's very important in a court of law. It's very important with a jury. It's very important when you're doing a prosecution or the police. They have to rationally infer things. They're like, okay, so you've been here for two hours and you don't seem to even care that you don't care that who killed your husband. You're not even worried about who killed your husband. You're not even crying really about who killed your husband. I can rationally infer something is a little odd about that. <laughs> now I could speculate that you're a weirdo, but I could rationally infer that. You are not that emotionally connected to what happened in a way that makes that is normal. So that's a difference between rational. Well, look at it again. Rational inference versus speculation. <laughs> that's a that's a great one. I really like that one. Oh, thank you, Joe. I, okay, so theoretically, you all can see this, which I can't. Joe, thank you very much um, for giving for supporting the channel. Um, don't know anything about either of these two cases. Pat, this has been such an interesting listen. Thank you, Joe. And I, I apologize for anybody I've had to block through half of this crap. Um, <sighs> struggle with the, the issues here. But yeah, I mean, I thought these two cases, I mean, I honestly knew nothing about these two cases either, Joe. I mean, I had never heard of them. <laughs> and people asked me to do them. So I'm like, oh, okay, you know, that's cool. Uh, and, and the first one, Jeffrey Pine, I was like, you know, yeah, there may not be super physical evidence, but, you know, that's pretty clear to me. But then when I started doing Sandra Melgram, I'm thinking, like everybody else, oh, my God, this is, this, how would this, how could this woman have done this? And then tie herself up and all this stuff. It makes no sense until I started looking at her story. And that's where it all fell apart. So can we just say she just said a whole bunch of crap that makes no sense and changed her story and, or... Does it, the 16 hours, and this is, again, I, I've never heard anybody talk about the 16 hours. They talk about a couple hours. There's no couple hours. If she had, if she had, had a, a, some kind of seizure, they'd hit her on the head and she had a seizure, and she was out for a couple hours and woke up struggling, I get it. If she had said she laid in that damn that closet all 
night long, all through the next day, struggling to get out of her by, by, uh, the bindings. And she was hitting the walls. And now she had bruises all over because she was trying so hard to get out of it and find out what happened to her husband. She was screaming and screaming till her voice, her, her throat got, you know, was so <laughs> hoarse. I would believe her. She said nothing. Oh, I just slept for 16 hours, woke up and the dogs are barking. Oh, look, people came to rescue me. What? Doesn't make sense at all. Uh, let's see. Okay, and I'm not sure how you come up with this, but okay, I can rationally think Casey Anthony may not have killed at Kaylee. Okay, however, I believe she's guilty of mishandling a corpse. Okay, this this is the okay. I'm going to say that some people think that Casey Anthony. There's no physical proof that she committed the, this crime. That somehow the child just died and ended up in her trunk with tape on her face, uh, clearly murdered. Now, see, that's the thing, too. There's with with Kaylee, there was no accidental death. So if if there was an accidental death issue, like let's say she had OD'd on some drugs. Like, like, let's say Casey and her boyfriend were doing drugs, and Casey went out to the store, she came back, and, and Kaylee had gotten into something, some meth that had been laying on the table and died. And a boy, a boyfriend said, let's put her, let's wrap her up and put her in your trunk and then we'll figure out what to do. And then her boyfriend ran off on her. She's like, I don't know what to do. Okay. I could buy that. Kaylee was premeditatedly murdered. Premeditatedly murdered. She was knocked out long enough to be able to wrap tape around her face. So she was smothered to death, but not fight back. That's premeditated murder. And because Kay Casey didn't give a crap about she, she went and partied for her entire month. Nobody else killed Kaylee but Casey. I mean, that's just, that's just, that's just very clear. Um, but see, that's the thing. When you put the totality of everything together, it makes no sense. Um, if she, if I say if she hadn't, if she hadn't, if she, if it looked like an accidental death, I could go with that, but that was not an accidental death. And everything Casey said, support said it wasn't an accidental death. Um, oh, oh, here's a good point. Question. Lisa says, who said they went right home after CVS? Well, they did. You know, I mean, I mean, oh, Sandra did because Jamie, Jaime's not there. Jaime is gone. Okay. That's what she said. They went home. Um, and that was that. So let's see. There's some weird stuff here. Um, Man, Elisa says, think how difficult it is to wrap duct tape around a victim's head three times. If a person is unconscious, it's a problem. Awake, another problem. No, it's not. If they're unconscious, that's the whole point. I mean, the whole point, and Elisa said, is that they are unconscious. Because the thing is, if you, if you, one of the difficulties people have of killing their child, usually it's a smothering type thing. But this is an older child, so it's not like a baby. A baby just kind of go, too bad. But an older child, it's more difficult. So if you don't want to go through watching your child die, if you can chloroform them out and have them be unconscious, and then you wrap the tape around, they simply just don't wake up. It's not that hard to do, especially when you're a total psychopath. Now you got to understand, I'm not talking, about, not talking about you and me. I'm not going to wrap duct tape around my children or my grandchildren because that would be horrifying. But if you're a psychopath, yeah, you can do that. And that's like, oh, and then put a little heart on him. Too bad, baby. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, okay, uh, th that's a good question. And I honestly do not know the answer to this one. Um, I think it's a good question, though. What was what was Jaime's time of death? Did he die around midnight or the next day? Okay, I'm going to say, I don't know. I, I could not get hold of the autopsy report. I, I heard some of the autopsy report on one of the, the, the shows. But I, I, I looked and looked and couldn't come up with it. Now, for, first of all, sometimes people say, well, you know, if you, you're not a very good profile, if you can't get the information, I'm not paid. If you pay me <laughs> to work your case, I will be talking to lawyers. I'll be talking to the medical examiner. I'll be talking to everybody. I'll be calling the police. I'll be finding a way. I'll be getting court records. Look, I'm doing YouTube. And I, I can barely keep this channel going as it is. <laughs> I can't spend 200 hours searching down information. Uh, so quite frankly, I'm not sure 
what his time of death was, but it's a good point. Now, I'm going to say, to be realistic, uh, they're not going to be able. Now, remember, again, 16 hours passed at least. If not, possibly 18. We don't know that they didn't come home. And she, killed, she He could have been killed at 10 p.m. at night. We don't know when he was killed. So it could have been 18 hours. And at a certain point, it gets a little tough, you know, to figuring out exactly when he was killed. Uh, the basic point is, is that he clearly was, he clearly died fairly after he got stabbed 32 times and bludgeoned, he died about then. <laughs> um, whether it was 10 p.m. at night, 12 p.m., 12 a.m. and 2 a.m., quite frankly, doesn't even matter because they have no evidence of anybody in the neighborhood breaking in. She was there the entire time. So there was only one person available to kill him. It was her. And there's no proof of anybody else being there. So that timing, I don't think would matter a whole heck of a lot. You know, in this particular instance, uh, sometimes it's very, very important. But in this particular instance, it would be interesting, but not necessarily really important. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, let me see what you have. Peter, Peter Hyatt has to say. Peter Hyatt's analysis of a phone call from Casey Anthony is chilling. She practically had told how she had killed Kaylee, if you believe him. Oh, you know, I'm a big Peter Hyatt fan. So he's one of the few people I recommend. Uh, so, P yeah, Peter Hyatt does some pretty, I, I disagreed with him a couple of times. I, I always point out how I disagree with people just a little bit because I want people to understand that experts don't always have to agree 100% with each other. Um, uh, and I disagreed with him uh, on one particular case. Um, that was, um, mm -mm -mm. I'm just blanking now. What's her, the boy who went missing in uh, Oregon? Somebody help me out here. Um, he, he he did an analysis I thought was a little bit, I, I didn't quite buy, but majority of the stuff he does, I'm right on, I'm right there with him. So I, I consider Peter Hyatt one of the better, uh, uh, Kyron, thank you. <laughs> Kyron, Kyron. I did. So if you want to hear what I have to say about that, go to my video on Kyron. Um, I think Peter, Peter Hyatt is very much most of the time on point. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you're, when you get into analyzing all kinds of details, sometimes I think you can go a little overboard, which I think it may be happening in Chiron, but you know, Peter probably thinks I'm wrong a couple times too, <laughs> but I like Peter Hyatt very, very much. Um, and, um, I'm, I haven't heard the thing on, uh, Casey Anthony, but I'm probably going to give a thumbs up to Peter on that one. <laughs> oh, but, uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, after Deborah says after 16 hours, she would have dehydration. So she wouldn't not be herself at all. Uh, you're not that dehydrated in 16 hours. I've, I've not drank anything for 16 hours. Unless you're in the desert, you're not that far off. It, you know, it's the same kind of thing people say about, oh, you know, it, that person didn't eat for three days. They were starving. No, no. I, I, I fasted for 20 days on water once. I didn't starve to death. I lost a lot of weight. I, and I can't seem to do it again. Damn it. I really want to lose weight, but you know, no, you probably aren't going to dehydrate under those circumstances in that particular amount of time under, you know, the, it wasn't extremely hot in there or anything like that. So it was a, it was a room temperature house. She'd be okay, but it'd be interesting because she theoretically, you know, if she wasn't actually lying on that floor the whole time. She could be having a little, little dinner and having some drinks and, cleaning up after the dogs and watching TV. We don't know what was going on. Or if she was really truly on the floor for 16 hours straight, she just would be, would have been a long 16 hours. There's no question about that. All right, let's see what else you have to say. I'm going to back up here a little bit. Um, okay, I don't agree with the motive. J uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do not get to fellowship because they divorce. It happens all the time and they don't get to fellowship. Yeah, there's a yes and no on that. I think it depends why you get divorced because uh, I know there is an issue about that. There has to be a, a righteous reason to get divorced. You can't just divorce because you don't like that person. Um, there, 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 now I don't know. I mean, there are some, there are some fairly strict rules about that. And so um, usually it is because of adultery that you're not supposed to do that other than that. And, you know, uh, I, I don't know if the witnesses have, have, have you know, softened some of those rules in the in, in the recent years but certainly back back in the time that this happened with her i know that just fellowshipping 
was something that did happen if you if you left if you divorced your mate without good good cause it is problematic so um i i, I will say that that is probably true um I mean, when in reality, how many, you know, it's not like witnesses kill off their mates because they want to get divorced. I mean, so this is one of these weird things where, you know, you look at motive and you're like, how often does this happen? And the answer is not very often, um, you know, but one does not necessarily know what's lurking in that person's brain. Like I, I pointed out, she could have Munchausen's. I don't have a clue if she has Munchausen. I don't even have a clue she's guilty. I can't prove it. Okay. If I run the, if I could see all the rest of the information, I could say absolutely, um, or not absolutely. Um, but she might have a condition. She might have Munchausen's, in which case she loves attention. She always, she says she has this problem. She has that problem. She gets more and more attention from those things. And maybe she just wasn't getting enough attention. Her husband was, you know, juicing and looking good. And she was, she wanted more attention. I don't know. But then again, maybe none of that's true. So the motive issue is always very tricky because we all have motives all the time. I mean, I got divorced after 25 years. If my husband ended up dead, they, somebody would say I had a motive. <laughs> I'm not the kind of person who kills off my, my, my mate because my marriage went bad. I'm not that kind of person. But there are people who would say, she got motive. And they, I'd be going, Okay, that's possibly true. So the so the problem is, the motive alone cannot be it, and we we can we can we can speculate. I get what was that word again? <laughs> Factual, yeah, speculation. Speculation. You could speculate that she wanted to get out of the marriage, but she would not be in good standing with the witnesses. So she thought if he died. She would get more attention and then nobody would blame her and she'd be, you know, she'd have her life with the witnesses and his money um, and her freedom. One could speculate that. I don't think I can make a rational inference on that. And that's why I point that out. Uh, I don't know if I can rationally have that inference because A, I don't know they had a bad marriage. I don't know whether she couldn't have gone to the elders and talked to them and there, something couldn't have been worked out. I don't know that absolutely she would have been disfellowshipped under these circumstances in that particular moment uh, i don't know and therefore i can't make a rational inference on that i don't have anything on that i, I really don't um i could speculate but i don't have it my problem is with her story my problem is with i can't see there's any any proof of a home invasion i can't see there's any proof of a burglary I can't see that anybody would even want to burglarize that location with the cars in the driveway and the barky little dogs. I can't, her story is what gets me the most. Even if she's loss of memory, even if she had a seizure, I can't get past the 16 hours and the fact that she indeed could have tied herself up and put the chair wedged under the door. I can't get by that. Now, I wish I knew more about the case. If Kathleen Zellner wants to bring me in on the team. And she says, look, I'm so convinced that uh, uh, Sandra Melgar is totally innocent. I will bring criminal profiler, Pat Brown, who is questioning some of these things. I will bring her in and I will let her go through. I will let her see every shred of evidence and I will let her try to, you know, uh, be devil's advocate. And we will prove that Sandra, Sandra is innocent. I put that out there to you, Kathleen Zellner. I'm happy to work with you. You know, first I think you're making a murderer crap and Stephen Avery is garbage. I'll say that because I think you know damn well he's guilty as hell. But I won't hold it against you if you want to bring me in on the Sandra Melgar case because actually I would love to see the rest of the information. I really would. So if you want me to work with you and I'll do it, I'll, I'll do my best to, to be the devil's advocate but if I find out that there's enough evidence to prove her innocence, I'll go with that, Kathleen. And I will stand beside you and say, that woman's innocent. I'm okay with that. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm relieved you think she's likely guilty. I don't want an innocent person in prison. Well, you know, that's the thing is, nobody wants an innocent person in prison. And, and you know, 
This case bothered me more than most about an innocent person being in prison. Because what I point out about the Innocence Project so often is they're like, oh, this poor guy was so innocent and now we've gotten him out of prison. And you find out the guy's a 10-time rapist. <laughs> you know, it's like, I really don't care if he spent his life in prison. He's a creep. This woman did not appear to be a creep. Sandra Melgar doesn't appear to be a bad person. According to everybody, she's a great person. You know, I mean, and, and if she didn't do this crime, she was a happily married woman, raised her daughter, stayed an honorable Jehovah's Witness, which is, you know, I mean, I, I, I respect people who respect their, their, their religious beliefs. She was an honorable Jehovah's Witness who did, you know, who, who lived up to her, 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 you know, beliefs. Um, oh, by the way, so somebody wants to, some people point out, well, she was breaking her beliefs because she was drinking alcohol. Jehovah's Witnesses are okay with alcohol. Jehovah's Witnesses do not have an anti-alcohol thing. <laughs> they are okay with alcohol. I mean, not to excess, but it is not, it is not forbidden in the religion. So don't go there. Um, so that she and her husband wanted to have some drinks that night and celebrate is, is perfectly fine. So of all the people who are in prison, who people are claiming are innocent, she is the one that I would most likely want to believe is innocent. I really do. I just can't get by her story. And I, I want to, I would love to have all the, I would have like to talk to her. I'd like to have more evidence. I'd like to see the police reports, the autopsy reports. I'd like to see every single thing about this case and see if I can somehow find a way that her story can be acceptable and not prove her guilt. I would like that because of, I say of all the people, this is one person I'd like to find innocent. If I could find her innocent, I would like that a lot. All right. Let's see what else you have to say. Um, let's see. I have no idea what that is. Okay. Let me go back here. Let me go back a little bit. I'm back. Oh, what the heck happened to me? Yeah. Okay, I'm going back here just to check. <laughs> and Dee Dee says, I, I soak in my whirlpool tub every night, and I'm pretty sure I could hear the TV in my bathroom. Pretty sure I could hear someone being murdered. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird uh, that... The, the noise is not so big. You, you know, you're talking about a guy who's being stabbed 32 times and bludgeoned. You would think he'd be saying something, you know? If you can hear the dogs barking, and she said she could hear the dogs barking, you think she could hear somebody be murdered. But so the problem is from the time she claimed she got out of the whirlpool until she was in the in, in the in the in the closet, putting her, you know, uh, rubbing her um, lotion on. There's a lot of time in there where he should have been murdered right next to her. And she hears nothing. And suddenly she's just unconscious. So either either the killer's got a luckily unconscious woman, like, oh, that's oh man, I was gonna hit her on the head, but she's already unconscious. Or <laughs> or she was facing away. It doesn't even say she was facing away. I'm not even sure which direction she was facing when she supposedly got hit over the head. Say that says a lot of that story just didn't really work. In. So that is a problem. Um, oh, you say I get not wanting medical attention, okay. In, in the case of your husband has just been murdered and you are claiming that, first of all, you're claiming you had a seizure. And secondly, you're claiming that you were hit over the head. I would think that is the one time you would want some kind of medical attention. First of all, because you just don't know if something happened to you that you don't even know. She could have been raped. If she's unconscious, she could have been raped. Wouldn't you want to know you've been raped? Wouldn't you want to know other things about what happened to you? Wouldn't you want to know if you have brain damage? I mean, she that, that's, again, the part of the story that doesn't make sense. It's like she knew nothing happened. If I, if I wasn't hit over the head and I didn't have a seizure, I have no reason to want to go talk to the people at the hospital because I know there's nothing wrong with me. But man, if I'm out for 16 hours and wake up, I'm like, what the heck happened? 
I wouldn't want to, I want to be checked out. So I'm having a problem with that. She wouldn't want medical attention under those circumstances. That's concerning. Um, oh, and I want to point this out. There are all kinds of uh, knots that can be pulled tight. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to do, Anna, with, with this whole thing, depending on what kind of material you have, when you have this kind of material, this is just a, this is just a rope tie. All you have to do on this rope tie is you pull this like this. Let me tell you, this kind of material can tie real. Shit, now I'm going to be able to get off my arm. It ties really tightly, really, re, really quickly. And now I can't get the damn thing off my arm. So, <laughs> yeah, because this material, it's very simple to pull it tight. And it's very hard. You know how sometimes you can't get, oh, I got finally got it. Um, you can't get, you can't untie your, your shoelaces because of that sometimes, because it depends on your shoelace, your kinds of shoelaces. But yeah, you know, sometimes you can do some, some materials will, you know, tie so damn tight. It's ridiculous. It doesn't take that much work. It does not. Um, let's see what else you have to say here. Um, uh, Doreen says it might vary by congregation. She may have known her particular friends would be appalled. Um, you know, uh, I mean, there's standards for the Jehovah's Witnesses, standards, rules, and regulations that the elders must follow. Um, but yeah, there might be some leniency here and there. Um, and I'd, I'd have to look up where, what was going on in the, in the year she, this, this occurred as opposed to 2022. My things might have changed, um, because they have, you know, every once in a while, uh, uh, information comes out that that changes certain regulations, and so that like I, I believe that used to be three meetings a week. I think it's gone down to two meetings a week due to due to the world that we live in today. Um, so that's come down. Um, and so I, I'm not quite sure exactly where that stood at the time. So again, but even if even if the whole issue was you know getting getting uh, you know divorce would be disfellowshipping. Um, we don't know that she had an issue. We don't know. And so I say the motive is very murky here. Um, so we can speculate. But again, what's that word? Rational inference. I got to work on the rational inference. I haven't got that in my head yet. But the rational inference is I can't get a rational inference out of that. And I don't I, I don't like speculation to the point where I really actually don't know. Um, there's no indication of a boyfriend on her part. There's no indication of a girlfriend on his part. Uh, she didn't tell anybody she wanted out of the marriage that I know of. Now, there was there was a claim I read someplace that they had been to the elders for counseling. I don't know if that's true. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that their marriage is in deep trouble. It could just mean they have some certain issues they want to work out. On the other hand, if you're going to go talk to the elders, you might have an issue. So, you know, but I, I'm speculating then. I'm, I, I'm not making inferences based on the evidence. And so, I, I, but again, the 16 hours and the tying up thing in the bathroom, and, the, and their story changing and things not being quite right, those, that's rational inference. Completely different. Um, uh, yeah, Christine says, married couples can separate in the case of physical abuse and neglect if one particularly attempts to hinder the other from being a Jehovah's Witness. Uh-huh. The marriage after divorce on the grounds of adultery. Yeah, that's, that's part. Uh, apparently, there was no case of Jaime um, being abusive. You know, there are other reasons for, you know, you can get a divorce besides adultery. I mean, there are certain reasons. That's why you go to the elders and talk to them and try to find out where you stand. I mean, there could be issues of uh, child molestation. There could be issues of your husband's a serial killer. You know what I mean? <laughs> they might let you off on that. So, you know, yes, I mean, there are some other reasons why you might be permitted. But so they say this is this was something the prosecution threw out there, which I wasn't totally comfortable with because I didn't think they had any proof of that. You know, I just didn't. So I was concerned about that. Um, let's see. Uh, listen, oh, let me see what you're saying here, Deborah. I think your point about the jacuzzi is key. No one would leave it on. And 20 minutes max, it'll be dehydration or heat. Oh, you're talking about the jacuzzi, like too much heat. You know, I, I'm not sure. Okay, the jacuzzi issue. Now, I know if like we have an out, uh, outdoor jacuzzi and I know that, you know, we put it up really high and it bubbles and it's hot and toasty, right? And you do like only stay there 20 minutes or you can, you can pass out, you know? 
So you got to be careful about that. So, you know, you take your drink. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, I like to take my little drink out there too. Uh, so you get your wine and you get out there and you sit out there in the jacuzzi and you look around at the world and you bubble, bubble, bubble. But about 20 minutes later or 30 minutes later, you're like, okay, we're done. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about the bath jacuzzi. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't think it's as hot as the outdoor jacuzzi. I think you can bubble it and not have it be the, that hot. Uh, even the outdoor jacuzzi, I think you can choose your temp. Um, so I don't know. You may be able to have a lower lower bubbly rate and maybe just sit in there and bubble and it's not all that hot. So I don't know that that's going to be a dehydrating factor um, or, or, or a problem because it's, you know, I think you can control that. I just don't know who the hell wants to sit in a jacuzzi for two hours straight. And I don't know any man who will do it. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's yeah, and th this is this is what I point out. 16 hours is a long, it's key. Like you say, I, I can't get past, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking about cases, I'll say there's that one thing that sticks in my craw that I cannot get past. In the Madeleine McCann case, I keep saying the key to the Madeleine McCann case is a little girl went missing in Portugal, supposedly. Um, she was missing. Um, the family, they had a man who was seen taking a child of that looked like her, carrying that child in his arms, coming from the direction of the vacation flat toward the beach. At the time she went missing. And the parents of Madeline McCann were not interested very much in who that man was carrying away a child that looked like their child. And I can't get past that. I'm like, how would you not care? That could be the man who kidnapped your kid, and yet you're not interested. You're interested in somebody else who was seen carrying a kid, but not that guy. Why not? What is it? I don't care with you. And the, the, the claim is they look like the, the child's father, Jerry McCann. I don't care if the guy looked exactly like me. You know, if my child was being carried away by a man who looked exactly like my husband, I would tell the public, look, my husband was with me, but there's a dude out there who looks just like my husband. It's close enough as, you know, people are going to like similar similarities. Hey, that's a, that's a great description. Look at my husband. Find a guy who looks pretty close to my husband. He's got my kid. I would be all over that, but the McCann's weren't interested. That stuck in my craw. And forever since the very day of that, the, that very beginning of that over, over a decade ago, that has been the one piece of information that has bugged the living heck out of me. I've got other reasons to be, you know, have other concerns, but that's the one in that crime. In this crime, it's the 16 hours in a closet. That, uh, you know, I don't mind the 16 hours in a closet. If this, if she had been hit over the head and woken up in the closet and said she had struggled for the whole damn day and night, she was there. She didn't know how many hours had passed and she was there screaming for help and kicking doors, and struggling, and trying to get out, and, and her arms are all like raw, and whatever, because she'd been in that closet for 16 freaking hours, I'd go with, this is a home invasion, and that woman's innocent, my problem is, 16 hours, she didn't even, she didn't know what happened during the entire 16 hours, she never tried to get out of the closet, she never tried to get out of the, bi the bindings, it just doesn't compute, it doesn't make sense, that will stick with me and I can't get past it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's true. I make needle lace. There, there are all kinds of fancy loops that pull irrevocably tight. Oh my God, they do. I mean, you know, I say this, I, I was surprised. it kind of depends on the material, but man, you pull the wrong way on this sucker. I really thought I was, I was going to be stuck in my house. I tell you, let's see. Uh, Deborah says the timeline doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that she would not go to the hospital after 16 hours. She would need water, especially after being in a warm jacuzzi. Again, I don't know how long she was in the jacuzzi and how warm it was, but just, I mean, especially, you know, my husband's been killed and I've been in a closet. I would want the, I would want everything to be um, documented and I wouldn't want to know if something had happened to me. And she didn't, she, she, she didn't care for an outside opinion because I'm going to say that she knew exactly what happened to her. And that's why I can't get past, you know, when people say she's innocent, I'm like, I want to believe she is because it's such a bizarre case. I mean, of all the cases, this would be the one and I, and I can't get past that. No. <laughs> case says, uh, I think you're so right about the McCann case. 
I think I am, but you know, we're, we're waiting to see. Apparently, you know, as the get will go, that like, like case will go on for like half a century. Oh, do home invaders usually bring rope and knives? No, um, they often bring guns and sometimes a knife. Why, well, you know, because you know, you want to bring if you're going to home invade, because there's a difference between burglary and home invasion. So if you're burglarizing a place, the idea is nobody's home. So you don't really need that crap. You just need to be able to break in somehow. And then when you get in there, you got all your crap and you get the hell out of there. Um, home invasion, you're assuming somebody's home. That usually means that you're going to bring some kind of weaponry with you because you know you're going to encounter the residents of the home. Uh, sometimes you do tie them up. This is true. Um, uh, you know, you hold out guns, you tie them all up, and you steal their stuff, and sometimes you kill them. Sometimes that happens in home invasions. Uh, that can be very, very violent, especially if you have two or three or four guys all going together. So it's a gang kind of thing, you know, and. Uh, but to arrive at a place and not apparently have, uh, you know, use it, look, yeah, say nothing, nothing computes where this is a home invasion. It doesn't look like it. Um, the whole scene doesn't look like it. So, you know, I haven't found anything there that convinces me it's a home invasion. Oh, that's a good question. Here's a good question. I like this one. Christine says, how was it determined that she was out for 16 hours in a closet? It wasn't. Here's what she said. Okay, here's what she said. She said, I went and did the lotion. Now I'm gonna say I'm moving it, I'm moving the time frame back because I don't believe for a minute that was 2, 2 a.m. I'm gonna move it back to midnight to be generous. I really think it might be 10 or 11. I don't even know that they went in the jacuzzi. I think that nobody's even proven they were ever in the damn jacuzzi. But let's assume they were and she went and did the lotion thing. 12 a.m. She goes out. She remembers nothing after that moment. Oh, except for after she's in prison. Now she remembers somebody tying her up and a lady and a man. Okay. I'm going to say it's garbage. Okay. <laughs> okay. So she supposedly is out. Boom. 12 a.m. Either hit on the head or has a seizure or hit on the head and has a seizure. Then she says she woke up sometime later. She woke up and realized she was on the floor of the closet and could not move, but she didn't say she had bindings on, which I think is very strange. She wouldn't know she had bindings on. And then she went back to sleep. And I, okay, I'm okay with that because I do know that sometimes when you have a seizure, you can wake up from the seizure. Your seizure is finished. You're confused and tired. So you're just like, oh, you know, just, oh, I'm just going to go back to, I just, I don't care. And I've slept on a floor before. So I'm not going to say she couldn't have fallen asleep on the, on, on the closet floor. I'm okay with that. She goes back to sleep. So now assuming that most time you have a grand mal seizure, it's only the last five minutes or whatever. So at 12.05, 12.10, oh, let's give her a 30 minute seizure, which is not normal. Okay. Let's say 12.30. She wakes up. She realizes she's on the floor. She's exhausted. She falls back asleep. Let's even give her 1 a.m. I'm going to give her 1 a.m. An hour long seizure. That's and then she wakes up. She realizes she's on the floor. She goes back to sleep at 1 a.m. in the morning. She claims she did not again get consciousness back until 4.30 p.m. when she heard the dogs bark and people coming into the house. So she is claiming she slept from at least 4, 1 a.m. in the morning till 4.30 p.m. the following day, which is 13. Oh, wait, I can't count. at least 15 and a half hours, 15 and a half hours after she woke up, she went back to sleep for 15 and a half hours straight. Mind you on a hard floor with her arms and legs tied behind her. Even if you are tired from a, a seizure and you go to sleep, even if you slept for a normal eight hours, it's not really easy to sleep on a hard closet floor with your arms and legs tied. At some point you're just going to go, what the hell is going on? And you'd wake up very, very miserable and uncomfortable. You wouldn't sleep for 15 hours straight. But that's her claim. There's no proof that that's true. There's no proof she was ever in the closet until the until she was found. She could have been in that closet 30 minutes for all we know, or an hour. Whenever she decided to put herself in the closet, maybe the time. She could have decided to put herself in the closet. She thought somebody might be by by noon and put herself in the closet. She could have laid there for eight hours. I'm not saying she couldn't have, but she wasn't fighting to get out of the 
bindings. So let's say, let's say I'm like, you know, it's, it, it's nine o'clock in the morning. What if one of my family comes over earlier? I'm screwed, right? Oh my God, I better get in that closet. And I got to, I got to make sure that I got the door right and the bindings right. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go pee first and then I'm going to get in the closet and I'm going to work on the door. Okay. I got the door. Okay. The door's done. Now it's 10 o'clock in the morning and my door is fixed. I can't get back out because I just, you know, lodged the chair under the door. So now I can't get out anyway. Now I got to work on my bindings. Now I'm going to sit here and do my bindings. Oh, I've, I want to make sure the bindings are right. Oh gosh, I'm more successful than I thought. It took me five freaking minutes. Now it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Crap. Now I guess maybe I'm hoping somebody will show up by 11 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to lay in the damn closet for the next six hours. Maybe somebody will come by because they tried to call me and they couldn't get them and they thought something was weird and they came over and they they knocked on the door and couldn't get an answer maybe they'll come in early maybe they'll be here at 11 in the morning i only have to lie on the damn floor for an hour but then an hour goes by and then two hours goes by and three hours go no oh God, i really have to pee but during that time if you know that you want to be in the bindings and you want the chair under the door what you're not going to do is try to get out of the bindings and, and try to smash the door down so you're not going to be bruising yourself up and smashing the door down because you want people to find you in the bindings. Because if you know, for God's sakes, let's say you got out of your binding, because I did. What if I got out of the bindings and could get out of the door? Well, then you screwed your whole, whole, your whole stage crime scene, right? Because now you're out. Now you can't prove that you were locked in the closet. So you don't want to get out. So you don't want to beat the door. You don't want to do anything about this. That's why I believe she's claiming to be unconscious for 16 straight hours because she has no excuse for not trying to get out of the bindings and not trying to get out of the closet. So because if you staged it, you're not going to try to escape. So. Oh, this is a good point. Um, Molly says 32 stabs in a rage seems more likely than in a home invasion. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, when you have massive, um, uh, excessive amounts of stab wounds, excessive amounts of bludgeoning, you're talking usually about a rage crime, but I, I have to say that I have known serial killers to do that. So it's not always a person who's got a personal relationship. Um, sometimes home invaders have done that just because a, they, the guy person person pisses them off. Like there, there's a claim that the safe has a piece has, has a as a as a blood on it on, on the handle. Now they could a home invader could have said open the safe, and Jaime says I I'm not going to open the safe, or Jaime says I can't remember it's I can't remember the the code. He's like so freaked out he can't remember. It. Like I I have a code to my safe which honest to God I've had moments where I can't remember it. <laughs> And, you know, I have to do it. It's like, a, like I have an osmosis thing where I have to know exactly which way to do it. Um, but if I were under stress, I don't know if I could remember it. So I could see them getting pissed off at me. Open the safe. I can't do it. And they get so damn mad, they attack me. That's possible. So that's why, you know, the concept of a home invasion, I can't get rid of um, completely. Um, now, it's interesting that the person didn't stab very deeply. Um, they stabbed really crappily i mean you know if you're really a good home invader or a really good killer you you know how to stab in the lethal spots but this person seemed to be like like all over the place um so kind of crappy at doing it uh, but again you know a person could be under drugs and not do a good job of it so it it does look more like a cr personal crime of rage but I, I i personally would not rule out um home invasions or serial killers just because I've seen, I've seen them. Some serial killers have stabbed somebody 150 times <laughs> because it's fun. You know, sometimes people just like stabbing people. It's fun, you know, but it's, again, it's a totality of the evidence. I can't come up with a good reason for the, the rest of the stuff. Joe says, how do you differentiate between people doing illogical and odd things whilst under shock and duress and those whose behavior is unusual and suggests possible guilt? That is a tricky one. And that is what the, that is what one of the big issues is with this kind of thing. They're like, okay, the woman was married 32 years. She and her husband, according to her, we had this lovely evening together. 
we have, we went out and had our dinner. We had, we got our drinks. We're sitting in the jacuzzi, you know, Hey honey, we're talking about our daughter and our possible grandchildren. Mm -hmm. What do you think, honey, you know, what, what should we do at retirement? Should, we're going to travel. They, they were interested in traveling, you know? So, you know, what, should we get a like an RV? Should we travel all over the place? What could we do now that we're going to be free? You know, okay, or, you know you're going to be retired. We can do all kinds of different things. That could have been a great two hours of happiness. And then, you know, here she is. All things are good. Her husband goes, oh, look at the dogs barking. I'll be back in a second. She says, okay, honey. And she goes in and she's changing her clothes. Changing. Okay, so now she's putting on a lotion because, you know, she's getting ready for bed. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, she just wakes up on the bottom, the floor of the closet. And finds out her husband has been brutally murdered. She sees it because after she's been, after her brother-in-law and the family come over and they get her out of that, you know, contraption, she, she they're screaming and there's hysterical crying. She goes to the closet, sees her husband stabbed 32 times and brutalized, Texas Pulse, that she's a supposed nurse from way back when, or maybe a practical nurse. And then knows he's dead, and and then you're in, and then you're in the police station with with a guy, couple guys who you know. Can you talk about a more uncomfortable scenario? I mean, your whole life has just been destroyed. Let's just you know, if you haven't planned this, yeah, you may be getting half a mil, but your whole life has gone overnight all your dreams of the future, the man you supposedly love. If you love that man, your man is gone. Your, the father of your child is gone. Your daughter is going to be devastated. The friends are going to be devastated. Your whole family is going to be devastated. You're going to be a widow. And, and that's not a fun thing to be. Let me tell you, people don't invite you as many places when you're a widow. Um, Cause you can't go with your mate. You can't do couple things anymore. You got no, you don't want to travel, but now you got nobody to travel with. The whole thing is horrifying. It's absolutely awful. And then there you are in the police station and they're asking you questions and you can't remember anything because you had that, you know, you had something, you know, you got, you had a seizure and you just, your brain is gone and you're completely, you know, you're devastated. You can't think anymore. And, you know, it's just horrible. And they ask you dumb questions and you just don't, I'm telling you the truth. I just don't remember. Yes. I love my husband. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult to determine sometimes whether the person is in shock, uh, what their response would be, whether they just can't fathom what had happened, whether they can't, they don't want to even visualize what had happened. I think all of that's very, very difficult. And I think you want, don't want to jump to conclusions because of that. The, again, I go back to the problem of the 16 hours. That wasn't even mentioned in, in the interview. I, and I've never seen it ever mentioned. I have a, that's why I'm saying this is the one thing that drives me nuts. I looked, I looked everywhere. Every comment, nobody mentioned 16 hours. They just say she was in the closet. I'm like, but it was 16 hours, 16 hours. Something's wrong here. And so, yeah, it's, it's difficult. So that's why, you know, the, the person's statements are a piece of the information. And then there's all the other information, the totality of the evidence and, and taking everything into context and, you know, and not blowing something out of proportion, being aware of it, and then looking for other information that would help you, you know, either confirm something or prove something not to be true. Um, and, uh, you know, did they, there's a lot of claims that they did a, they did a shoddy job, uh, the police did a shoddy job, but that's often claimed. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't know, maybe they did do a shoddy job. It's possible that they, after she told the story, they were so like, she did it, <laughs> that they didn't work that hard to prove otherwise. So it's, it's, it's a weird thing. I mean, we want to believe that, again, are we following rational inferences as leads or are we just speculating and, and, and wasting a whole lot of time on dumb speculation? And so what happens a lot of times, and I hear this all, this happens all the time, that why didn't they do this? I'm like, because it was a waste of time. That's why. <laughs> Why didn't they, they, why didn't they follow that psychic's lead? Because a psychic is making crap up and they're not going to waste police. They have, and police have enough work as it is. They don't have time to follow some psychic's lead. Okay. They don't, there's no, there's no reason to follow it. So there, you know, so, so the family will, the family, uh, as a matter of fact, and some of these uh, videos will say, like the daughter will say, we came and we offered ideas. One of the ideas was that the daughter's first husband 
who she'd been divorced over five years from, had once uh, stolen some crap from their house because he was a drug, drug, drug user. Look into him. It's been five years. I mean, <laughs> it's been five years. Really? I mean, I don't know. Maybe the police did a little quick check on him and found he wasn't even in the area or yeah, an alibi or whatever. Maybe they didn't bother because they're pretty sure that Sandra had something to do with it. I mean, is that is that really the reason? They just said, we already know who did it, so we're not going to waste our time running down 20 leads of people we know didn't do it. That could be true, too. So you want to you want to spend time making sure that it isn't something else, but you also don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time on things that are pointless. And I don't know where the police, what exactly happened, you know, in the police investigation, but I do know that it did appear that they thought she did it, and I don't know that how much that uh, affected and how much they looked at other possibilities. I don't know if they could get past the story. And, um, you know, so, yeah. The murder, yeah, the, mur the murder weapon was the knife in the, in, in the tub. Remember, remember the knife in the tub? Yeah. Uh, and this, this is, this is one of the issues. The knife was in the jacuzzi. The knife is in the jacuzzi. It was clearly there. One of the, one of the claims, and I think it's a good point you bring that up. Um, Anna, um, because no, she did not have damage to her hands. And this is one of the defense's points, that if she had been stabbing him, that she would have had some damage to her hands, from um, to her nails from stabbing him. And she did not have any of that. That was one of the lack of physical evidence that the defense really pushes. Now, one of the things I noted, though, was there is a, there is a towel in the bathtub. I don't know what the towel is for, but sometimes people will take a towel and wrap it around a, the, the murder weapon on the handle so that they're, you know, and that'll give them, and that can prevent damage to their hands. I don't know. I don't know whether, you know, she didn't have much damage to her hands because he didn't, you know, maybe he was just not resisting very much. If she, if he really did have something holding him down, I mean, she just went like this really quickly. And he got a few cuts on him, you know, because he went like this and she was like that. Or there's also the point that he was he was he was hit over the head. It's possible also that he was hit over the head um, with something. And after he was hit over the head, he was rather stunned. And then he sort of staggered and sat down and then he started stabbing him. And he's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? It's one of these things that it's trying to visualize what happened when we don't know what happened. Um, and so again, yes, I, there, that's one of the things the defense brought up is that she didn't have damage to her hands. Same thing is true in the uh, Jeffrey Pine case. He did not, well, he had these two things here, but they're claiming he didn't have any blood on him and there was no blood in his car. So they always look for the negative. See, it didn't, you can't see the blood. So therefore it didn't happen. But then again, there was no blood in the rest of the house either. So you got, to, you, let's say you had this man and woman that she now claims were there at, at the house. Um, and he's being stabbed 32 times. You know, if you if you've been stabbing somebody a lot and there's blood on you, you you know, and you're a home invader, and you know, usually you're checking out all the the stuff that was being pulled out, which is I think fake because it didn't look like they were actually searching for stuff. It looked like a fake. You know, let's look, make it look like a burglary thing. But let's assume they were really doing it. They would do that after they did something to him, not before they did something to him. So you would think they would have some blood on them and there would be blood on them. There would be blood, even if they were wearing gloves. And so they protected their hands. There would be blood on the uh, bureau top. There would be blood on the drawers. There'd be blood stripping on the floors. They're running through the house because they're home invaders. There was no blood anyplace else. So it looks more like he was killed. Somebody washed up and then they faked a burglar. But you know, these are, interesting things that but i can't say i can't get by the story the story let's see what else Gre uh gretchen has to say you know i've always liked to read right in front of me but i can tell you half the letters are missing here God, i i don't know how to fix that it's another another problem i have to fix so i have to look over here and read you uh was was jaime expected anywhere the following morning like work no i don't believe so just wondering if he was why no one planned or checked up on him when he mysteriously didn't show up. I don't think, I mean, that's, I think there was nothing happening till 4.30 that afternoon. I don't know. Again, I have not been able to get hold of the police reports. Um, I've seen 
I watched two, two documentaries, one which was dreadful, one which was tolerable. Um, and then again on YouTube, um, and I, and I saw the, the, the appeal I'm getting, you know, a lot of the basics of it, but there's little pieces, which I wish I knew, which I don't. Um, and I don't know how accurate anything is. Um, so but I, as far as I know, no one was supposed to be checking up on him, but again, that could be very interesting because if she was in the, in, in, in the, in the closet for eight, 10 hours, it could be because she thought somebody might show up in the morning and she better damn well get her butt in there. Um, don't know. Uh, I, I wish, I wish I knew the answer to that, but the story is still strange, which is the problem. Hmm. Oh, Pat, what about Pine? Was there enough evidence to prove he did it? Well, see, this is, this is the thing, Lisa. This is what the defense says. This is why the instance project is going to get over all of this. There was no physical evidence that he killed her. There were the blisters on his hands, which would match the wood being her head being smashed in. There was the missing, missing piece of wood. Uh, there was a fact that the, 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 the front door was deadlocked, the garage door was closed, that nobody could access the house, but somebody who was already inside the house. Uh, there was the fact he, he, he he lied about where he went right after this, supposedly, right before this supposedly happened. He's, he had an alibi, but the alibi was a lie. Um, so can you, what's the word again? <laughs> I'm going to work on this. I love this word. I can't remember it. Rational inference. You can rationally infer from the lie of the alibi, from the blisters on his hand, from the fact nobody else entered the house, from the history that he had, for there being no reason for the crime except this is a crime of rage by somebody who likely knew her because there was no rape, there was no burglary, there was no nothing. The totality of the evidence points to Jeffrey Pine. There are always people who claim if you can't, don't have a video of him killing her, you can't say he did it. There's not a video of K Casey Anthony killing Kaylee. You can't say he did. she did it. There's not a video of O.J. Simpson murdering Nicole and... Uh, And the other wonderful guy, <laughs> the guy from the restaurant. Uh, I hate it when I pay, hey, I hate it when I forget victims' names just because I think that's a terrible. Ron, 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 Ron. Just I have terrible. It's not that I don't respect the victims; I just have no memory. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Ron Goldman. Ron Goldman. Uh, there's no video of him killing them. There is evidence after the fact and before the fact that link him to the crime. So. The fact that Ron Goldman, right? Yeah, Ron Goldman. Yeah. Um, the fact that we don't always have a video, or you know, it's really nice when somebody kills somebody. Not, 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 <laughs> not nice that they killed them, but when they kill somebody, then they go to their house and they drip the the victim's blood all over their couch. That's useful. Or they leave their DNA at the scene, like they raped them and they, oh, look, there's DNA on the woman that matched the guy and there's DNA in the woman that matched the guy and he dropped his license there. Okay. And we have a, vi we have a video of the camera showing him going in and we have, show have a video camera showing him running out with a bloody knife. Okay, that's really nice. Is that the only time we can convict somebody is when we have a play-by-play -play action and absolute DNA evidence and... The problem is DNA is not always at a scene. Blood is not always at a scene. You don't always have the physical evidence. That's why there's a thing called circumstantial evidence. And if you have enough circumstantial evidence, enough, where it is clearly obvious it is not somebody else and it is that person, then they can be convicted. It's just that in today's world, with all the publicity and with all the innocence projects and with all the Kathleen Zellners of the world, they will take any case that doesn't have 100% physical evidence like Jeffrey Pine and say, you can't prove that he's guilty. Well, he was proven guilty by a court of law. The jury found him guilty because they thought the circumstantial evidence was solid enough to say there was nobody else but Jeffrey Pine who committed this crime. Now, with Sandra uh, Melgar, it's such a weird crime. It's a much harder one to come to that determination. And yet the jury did. And I, I'm not a fond of civilian jury trials. So sometimes when I think I agree with the jury, it isn't necessarily because I think they, they cleverly came up with the right thing. I think it's sometimes they were like with the Sandra case, they were like back and forth. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, 
I don't know whether they had the right thinking mechanism to make the determination that she was guilty, but I do think that there was so, fairly solid circumstantial evidence that nobody else entered the home. She was the only one there. Her story didn't make sense. That's why she got convicted. And we can always argue what is the what is the what is the threshold for convictions? And you know, when you when you if you go and watch that that appeal, there's a very interesting part about that appeal as a, as to where the line is. You know, uh, if we're going to make the line so high, nobody will ever 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 get convicted unless they confess. And if we make the line too low, we're going to have a whole bunch of people who are in prison for no reason whatsoever because somebody didn't like them. So you have to have the the threshold be at a point where there's enough evidence to prove they did it, but not so ridiculous that absolutely you can never convict anybody. So it gets, it gets very, very tricky. What? Okay. Okay. This is okay. Anna, say none of the evidence was planted in the Stephen Avery case. None of it. That is absolute God's absolute nonsense. Don't believe Kathleen Zellner and making a murder. It's ridiculous. Uh, and, and I want to recommend that you go to Ken Maines, Unsolved No More. He does a whole thing on the Stephen Avery case. And he's like, he, he and I are in total agreement. Nothing was planted. And here's why. And he explains it better than me, but I'll explain it here now. People are saying that the police planted evidence because there was a huge, uh, huge case the, that Stephen Avery had. He was suing the government uh, for, for the last, you know, the crime he was convicted of, which he didn't commit, which he just looked like, just looked like the guy who did it. And, and, should have been the guy who did it, but wasn't. Okay, he had a right. He was wrongfully convicted of that case, and he had a, he had a, he had a reason to sue. Supposedly, the state was going to pay a huge sum of money. So the claim is that the police wanted to frame him because of that case. <laughs> and as Ken Maines points out, look, these are detectives. They could give a shit about the state having to pay out a whole bunch of money. I mean, no, the, the police officers and the police detectives don't care what the state has to pay. They want to collect their salary and go home. They don't care about the damn state. They're not going to plant evidence because, oh, we want, we don't want the guy to be able to the, 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 sue the state. They don't care about that crap. That is absolute nonsense. There was skin cells of Stephen Avery on the key and in the car, and the girl was burned up in his pit, fire pit right in front of his face. He committed the crime. Nothing was planted. That was That's one crime which absolutely nothing was planted. It's absolute nonsense, and please don't believe it. Uh, absolutely, please. Uh, this makes no sense. <laughs> Hello, I was watching the Pistorius video. Hope I'm not too late. Well, it's the end of the show, but you know, that's the whole, it's a video. <laughs> you can go back and watch the whole thing. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's always here for posterity. So um, I just want to see if there is anything else interesting I'll have to say. Uh, da, 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 I'm going backwards now. Um, uh, oh, that, that's a good point, Anna. Um, were any of the stab wounds especially lethal? No, no, like to the heart or throat, no. Um, or just a bunch of stabs that somebody was enraged. They, yeah, all, most of the stabs were really not very deep. Um, and it may be because if she did it, she didn't have a lot of strength. Um, and no, they weren't. I, I think he died of too many wounds and then and then wounds to finally penetrated enough things to cause him to die but yeah um no not really like there were not yeah there was a there was a cut like this but yeah most of it was not really lethal cuts it was more like yeah more like me, 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 me. i don't know but you know again some people are good with a knife so it could be a comb invader just going hey dude <laughs> it's <laughs> I, I like the point that sometimes crazy people do crazy stuff and 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 you know we we want to we want to have these these perfect hollywoodized things where you know oh god a serial killer for example would only do this and a and a angry husband would only do that well that's just not the way it works and sometimes just stupid stuff happens and so you know stupid stuff happens um i like there's a really interesting um uh, episode on uh, Death in Paradise, which is one of my favorite shows of all time, um, uh, now on season 11. Um, but there was an interesting show, um, I'll just give it away, just because it's just kind of interesting, where what happened was, I thought it was actually, you know, 
most of Death in Paradise's um, their their murders because of the murder every like every week, and you just really don't want to stay on that tiny small island, even though it's beautiful because people get killed constantly. But kind of unsafe. Uh, but this guy, it, it, what happens is the, the inspector um, is um, the, G, the DI. Is sitting there. At, it's he's on a small little island in a little. He's in a little uh, like a Airbnb, and there's only like six people staying there or whatever. He's in the little restaurant downstairs, and he sees the brother of the owner come by. He looks drunk, and he goes upstairs, and then somebody screams, and you know something's wrong, and they go up there and find he's dead. And they're like, "What the heck?" And and, and he's like, "Well, who could have killed him? Because I saw him go by." And I was watching the stairs, and I, I am the detective, uh, detective inspector, and I, I saw him go up the stairs. He was alive when he went up the stairs, and there's nobody upstairs. How the heck did he die? And he's got, he's got a knife wound. Turns out later on what happened was he had been in the kitchen with the, his brother's wife, who he loved. And what happened was somehow she had, she had a knife in her hand. She was like, like, like saying, don't do that or something. I forgot what the story was. She was like, don't do that. And he turned around into the knife and ended up stabbing him. And she was horrified because, of course, she wasn't intending to stab him. And this is the man she loved, you know, even though it was her husband's brother. But, and he's like, uh -uh. and then what happened was he took the knife out, told her to get rid of it. I think that's how it worked. I'm not sure. And, or wash it off and put it away. And then he covered up the wound and he staggered back out, went upstairs. They, people thought he was drunk. He wasn't drunk. He was, he had been stabbed, but he did not want her to go to prison. And so he did die, but it wasn't, you no, know, it wasn't what people thought it was. Now, of course, this is Holly, Hollywood eyes. Of course, this is a, okay. It's a British, it's a British show. So I can't use Hollywood eyes. I don't know what you, what do you call it in the UK? When, when you take a show and you make it more like fiction. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're, a, if you're an indie, you call it Bollywood. And if you do it, in, uh, there's, there is Lollywood out of, out of England, which is, is a, is a London version of Bollywood, which is, and then there is Hollywood, but what do you call it when a UK film or a UK show takes a normal thing and makes it more, we, we, we call it Hollywood eyes, but I don't know what you'd call it in the UK. Uh, so, but that's what they did. And, but it, um, but it does show how weird things could happen. I mean, once in a while, so there's something, something strange happens that nobody expected. And it happened in a weird way. And then when you try to go and analyze the crime, it makes no sense because you're like, what the heck? Um, so no, it's, it's, so that, that confuses things. And also, you know, when, when you're studying crime, one of the things I talk about uh, when, when I present uh, information is I said, you know, you got to be really careful about convictions because when you convict somebody, you say, this is the way it happened. And if you're, you're, you're a detective uh, and you're learning your trade and you're trying to understand crime scene analysis and they're telling you something happened, but it actually didn't happen that way, then you believe it happened that way. And you're like, okay, that explains how this happened. No, it didn't. That isn't actually how it happened at all. So now you're believing something that's a lie. So it gets very tricky <laughs> as far as that goes. You know, so yeah, so when you <coughs> that's not <coughs> not COVID, I just have a drive through. <coughs> My COVID's gone. Ooh. Oh, in the UK, <laughs> Joe says in UK we call that artistic license. We call that artistic license every place, but there's there's a Hollywoodizing of things. We take criminal profile and we Hollywoodize it <coughs> to the point where <coughs> it's so phony. It's not the way it works. And and Death in Paradise, I love the show dearly. Uh, but every one of the crimes is like no crime ever goes down that way. I love the way they go through the Ag Agatha Christie method of solving it, which is why I love the show, along with the camaraderie and the fact I want to go live there in that beautiful tropical paradise when people aren't getting murdered. But you know, I like the way the thinking process goes, even if nobody ever commits a crime that way and it's never solved that way. And that that that's just part of what you say, artistic license. But Hollywoodizing just sort of means that you've taken something basic and you've and you've <laughs> made it very fantastical, you know, <clears throat> when it wouldn't be that way. Um, 
Oh, that's it. Oh, you want me to do the Lizzie Borden case? <laughs> well, uh, Lizzie Borden trial inquest and a lot of other items are available online. Oh, I, you know, that's a great historic case, and I, I have that on my list. But, uh, uh, you know, I have to look at it and decide whether I – sometimes you can't get enough information to actually analyze anything. Like, you get a lot of – you get a lot of junk, essentially, and you don't know what junk is true and what junk isn't true. That's why I object so much to armchair profiling because, quite frankly, a lot of times we just don't know. Now, if I hadn't done – if I hadn't done this little example – I will guarantee you, nobody who has seen me do this example will think that she could have tied the knots herself. So when you go, so when you go all over YouTube and you see all the documentaries, they tell you that she couldn't have done that. But she could have. And so you're believing stuff that's just not true. And so the problem is, how do you know what's true and what is not true? And so it's it's, it's a very difficult thing. So when you come to conclusions and try to you know, oh, uh, the other person's absolutely innocent, the other person's not. And then you go crazy about, oh, my God, we got to, you know, oh, God, we got to go save this person. And then there's a huge, like, you know, crowd of people online, you know, signing petitions and crap like that and going to the media and <coughs> getting really angry online because somebody suggests that maybe that's not so. It's because they don't know what the facts are. They don't know what the truth is. They all they got are bits and pieces from a whole bunch of people who have agendas. So, you know, it's really hard to know. <coughs> Maybe I do still have COVID. <coughs> no, my COVID is mostly gone. I just have so, got a little topic. <coughs> cough, cough. Um, let's see. Gretchen says, oh, yeah. Now we just talked about Lizzie Borden. Yeah, I'm, it's on my list. I have a huge list now because... Everybody's come up with so many cases. And I did not know these two cases. I honestly did not know of these cases at all. Um, and so it's kind of funny because, you know, pe people assume I know every case on the planet, but quite frankly, I just do not. And, uh, you know, so th this, um, these two cases, I had no clue about at all. And uh, so I learn about cases from you guys when you tell me, check this out and check that out. I've, I've, I've run into so many fascinating cases uh, by you giving your, ideas so what's this what two guys fought over a girl i knew one guy got stabbed once in the femoral artery and bled out before help could come yeah that well <laughs> yeah why do guys fight over women i mean like all you do is you stand in front of the girl and you say which one of us do you like <laughs> you know how do you fight over somebody? Because if you know if that guy doesn't like me enough and he likes another girl, like go with the other girl. You know, I don't want to. I don't want a guy who wants another girl. You know, <laughs> you know, if you like the other girl better. Go with her because they're that's more appropriate. I don't want you hanging out with me. So I don't understand fighting over people. I always thought that was incredibly silly. <laughs> totally incredibly silly. Um, oh, thank you, Molly. Thank you. I appreciate that. Extra great show. I hope so. And I hope I didn't. Uh, do, block out the pictures for so long everybody got pissed off i hate it when i do that <sighs> sorry i've got all oh, the technical issues that's what happens when you don't do things and edit the crap out of them you know what i mean you just sort of gotta go with what you got yeah so uh ryan says 32 stabs is personal you know it's kind of funny because the 32 stab things i think it was 31 stabs actually so the, the theory was they were married 32 years. So she's like, this is for every year I had to put up with you. And she didn't get to 32. <laughs> now, I think that's artistic license, but probably probably not uh, accurate there. And, you know, the, the 32 stabs, again, uh, that can happen very quickly. If you look back on, uh, which, uh, which show was it? It was the... Um, mm -mm. Pennsylvania show about the boy who killed his brother. And I did, I did, oh, Josh. See, I can't remember anything in my head. Anyway, I did that crime scene reenactment and which oddly did not get demonetized, which I can't fathom for a minute why that wasn't demonetized. But, you know, I, I ran, I did what, hundred some, about almost a hundred stabs, 150. How many stabs did I do in that show? But I ran around my house stabbing this kid, you know, in a, in a reenactment. And I did it in such incredibly short period of time. I mean, that, that people people think it takes a really long time to do 30, 
31 steps. It does not. That could take you less than 10 seconds. Really, 10 seconds. And if and if I, you know, I mean, I could I could do it right here, right now. Let's just show you how quickly things happen because people see it as such a darn long time. Okay, I'm gonna put my stopwatch on because I always think it's just fun. Okay, so I'll just use this not I'll use this this. Okay, 31 steps. Ready? Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. That's 15 seconds. 15 seconds. And I, if you notice, I took some time in between some of those steps. 15 seconds for 31 steps. So two per minute, two per second, two per second. So person is in a rage. These can happen very quickly. And, and one of the things people will ask is that, like, how could she get away with stabbing him? And, he, you know, he's fighting back. How could this happen? The same thing happened with Ron Goldman. Um, people say, well, there had to be two people because Ron, who could have, Ron Goldman would have fought back. When you've been stabbed, sometimes, A, you don't even realize it because sometimes the, 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 the knife actually goes in and out like like you're like butter almost. And you don't realize it till later that you were stabbed. You could have this burning sensation, not even know what it is. But if they hit certain things at a certain time, you can start very quickly losing the ability to fight back uh, because you've been stabbed. Um, and if, especially if you've been surprised. Now, the prosecutor tried to say that uh, she had Jaime in a chair and that stool or whatever. And she came up behind him with a knife and basically stuck him and went like this. And if that happened, can you imagine? First of all, you're not expecting it. So you're suddenly like, you feel this extreme burn and you're like, what? And then she starts stabbing you. And then you you get up and you start turning around and you've already been stabbed 10 or 12 times, 15 times before you even turn around. I don't know what condition you're in at that time. I've never been stabbed before and I never want to be. But a lot of times, you know, if that's happening to you, your body starts shutting down. You, you, you start losing consciousness. You start, you know, and then I don't know how much you had to drink. Uh, that's something I, I really would like to know. I couldn't find any, any details on that. Um, if you've had too much to drink, um, which she, she could have been plying them with liquor. You know what I mean? They already drank at the restaurant. They drink some more when you get home. And you're just enough out of it where your response rate is slow. And you just, you know, you don't quite know what's happening and you don't have the stability all kinds of things can go wrong, you know, as far as fighting back, you know, and, and so we think things are so impossible and they're not. The same thing is true with blood spatter pattern. Depending on how a person is stabbing somebody, it depends how much blood they've got on them. Uh, so sometimes they end up with very little blood on them and they can indeed remove that blood in some way, shape or form and, and you know, deal with it. Uh, so, you know, the lack of evidence doesn't necessarily prove it didn't happen because, Obviously, somebody killed Jaime, whether it was Sandra or whether it was some home invader. Somebody stabbed him 30 times and hit him over the head with something. And again, he might have been hit over the head first, which made him, you know, half unconscious and was easier to stab him. So, you know, that may have happened first and therefore he was already not functionable. Um, but then, you know, they say the person who stabbed him, why didn't they leave blood all over the house? Because they had to run through the, but I keep going downstairs, this one floor. Okay, he had to leave the bedroom. If the person who killed Jaime, well, first of all, he had to go check all the crap he wanted to steal. And then he had to run out of the house and there's not one shred of blood anyplace else in the house. You, that's even more unre unrealistic than, than her, and she didn't leave some blood from the time she hit, uh, attacked him to the time she could go back to the jacuzzi and get rid of some of the, I don't know how they say there's no blood in the drain because the dang, the knife was in there and the knife had blood on it and the blouse was in there and the blouse had blood on it. So I'm not quite sure how that's not relevant, you know? Um, and if the, if she could run that jacuzzi, I don't know, 14 hours straight, 16 hours straight. I don't know how long the blood stays in the drain. I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, and I'd like to, I'd like to see absolutely you know, what, what their, their tests were, what the chemicals were, what, how they do that. And what were the chances of them being able to discover that particular type of evidence after it had been washed for 12 hours straight, you know? So, you know, lots of interesting questions. Let's see. Um, Oh, 
Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, Gretchen, thank you. I'm loving your book on Cleopatra. Thank you very much. Cleo, the Cleopatra book, in case you don't know, I wrote a book called The Murder of Cleopatra. I went to Egypt and did a discovery documentary and I got rid of the snake. The snake did not kill Cleopatra. He was framed. Um, and I did get rid of that and all the historians did not agree with me. And then I went back to, uh, uh, to um, uh, Egypt and I spent a month in Egypt examining all the other issues um, about how her life and her death. And I've gotten rid of an awful lot of myths. And um, I'm hoping one day that I can do a TV series on it because it, the book, uh, you know, wasn't put out by a big publisher. So it was put out by a publisher, but not just not one of the huge ones. And so <clears throat> it hasn't been highly read by enough people. And I think it's a very important historical, um, I think it needs to be recognized historically because not so much for me, but just that I think Cleopatra has always, they've never told the truth about Cleopatra and, and how she how she managed her kingdom and, and how she how she survived and, and what, what really happened to her at the end of her life, which they just, the, the lies are so thick, it's ridiculous. And I've been able to disprove a lot of the, um, the claims made about Cleopatra at the end of her life. I mean, absolutely just prove them with actual evidence. So uh, I think it's one of my favorite things that I ever wrote. And I do hope that one day I can turn and do a, a, a actual TV series. I was supposed to, we had a, actually, I actually had a production company who was going to do a six part series with me. And then Egypt, Egypt had their, you know, revolution thing. And then it killed all the insurance. So you couldn't go there anyway. So I'm hoping one day again, I'll get another uh, production company in and we can do a series where I can go through each part of her life and explain all the evidence that shows who Cleopatra really was and how she really, how she really uh, managed as a Pharaoh and how, um, and what really happened to her with the battle of Actium and, and the end of her life in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. So, I mean, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I feel very strongly about and spent a lot of time doing and, yeah, you know, and I, and I just wish I could get the information out to more people. So, um, <laughs> MK says, I wouldn't want to be with anyone who didn't want me. I need attention. Lots of laughs. I'm certainly not going to prison over it. Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody doesn't like you, you know, I don't want, if somebody doesn't like me, I'm not going to go beg for it. I'm like, you know, if I'm just not good, if I'm just not your thing, I don't want you around. I, I don't understand the fighting cap. It's just a sin. <laughs> Gretchen, Gretchen says, glad you cleared the snake. Yeah, the snake didn't do it. Yeah, there was absolutely no way she was killed by a cobra. There was absolutely no way. She was murdered. She did not commit suicide. Uh, so read my book if you haven't read it yet. It's The Murder of Cleopatra. It's on Amazon. Um, and uh, she, she, she was murdered. She, there is no way Cleopatra had any intention of killing herself. So Yes, it's it's on it's you can you can get you can get it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, but you cannot find it in a bookstore anymore. And if you wonder why, people people who don't understand the uh, unfortunate book business, you can go in a bookstore and you can find books on Cleopatra, but you're not going to find mine. Uh, you're going to find people's books I don't like <laughs> their work, <laughs> and, and it's because they were Pulitzer Prize winning authors and they were hugely connected to the book publishing industry. And therefore their book publishers paid them, you know, a million dollars for the book. And they, I'm not necessarily a million, but maybe, maybe a couple hundred thousand. And they got a big book deal and then they get in all the Barnes and Nobles and their book never, ever leaves the shelves of Barnes and Nobles. They're there forever. And my book came out actually as a Barnes and Nobles for about two years, which was actually a miracle. Um, uh, Cause I did get a little play from National Geographic um, and from the archaeological society, a couple of things gave me a little bit of play, uh, so it did stay at least for two years in Barnes and Noble. Uh, not not a huge stack of my books, like like one of them or two of them, and and then eventually it just disappears. And so what happens is your book uh, just ends up on Amazon or and Barnes and Noble, and so you can still get it from Amazon and Barnes and Noble um, or eBay. Somebody will get rid of it, but. Um, yeah, it's. I'm going to do a whole series eventually on 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 YouTube about Cleopatra, because I really want the information to get out there. Because I think it's absolutely a fascinating criminal case, and the whole history. You can you can you can analyze history, and like the Battle of Actium has always been. I don't know how many are familiar with the Battle of Actium with Cleopatra, but basically the whole concept is is that Cleopatra was was, was with with Anthony, and they're fighting against Octavian. So they're these. Octavian comes from here, and Cleopatra and Anthony are here. And then 
there's this battle and in the middle of the battle Cleopatra goes oh hell with it and she she takes off deserting her husband and deserting all her men and then Anthony her husband so he's so love stricken oh my my beautiful lady's leaving and so he dumps his men and and chases after her that's the story and it's complete garbage it's absolutely complete garbage everything was a military maneuver and I can prove it so you know this is the kind of thing that was written in history as the 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 victors wrote this really anti-Cleopatra crap and it isn't about feminism because some people thought, oh, she's a feminist. That's why she's writing the book. No, no. It's about reality and truth because I can look at the evidence and say this is what happened. And so that's why I spend a lot of time in Egypt studying the architecture and the Nile inundations and, and how, to build, how to build ships back in the day, uh, the Ptolemaic Canal, all these different things which were real things. And therefore, people had to handle them in real ways. And so... There is so much about Cleopatra. It's a fascinating, a fascinating history of her um, and a fascinating what happened to her. And she's way smarter and way more. She was not a vamp. She was not, she didn't, she was not like suicidal. She was not crazy. She she may have been psychopathic, but <laughs> she, she was a pretty lethal person. But she was very, very logical in all the decisions she made. She was actually a brilliant ruler. And uh, she should be respected for being a brilliant ruler. Had a really bad run of luck. I mean woman had bad luck. And if she had had just slightly better luck, it wouldn't have been the Roman Empire. It would have been the Egyptian Empire, but she pulled the short stick. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> wait a minute. Okay. Scientists can't, that DNA vacuumed Loch Ness looking for the monster. Seems they could have Process the jacuzzi word for excessive DNA from blood. You know, there's, there's this new vacuum technique. There is. Uh, and I'm glad you put that, point that up because they're using this new vacuum technique theoretically in the West Memphis three homicides. Um, that's the claim anyway. And they may be using it in Jean Bonnet. Um, it's a methodology. And at, under certain circumstances, it might be able to gather more DNA than an, another methodology. But if there's no DNA, guess what? I don't care what the hell you use for a vacuum. You ain't finding nothing. If there's no DNA, there's no DNA. And water will kill DNA. Uh, chemicals will kill DNA. Lots of things kill DNA. And a kill or kill a good, you know, you might get partial DNA, but just not enough to work with. So what the defense team does is they always make this big, huge issue about DNA when sometimes it is valid and reasonable. And other times it's nonsense, especially touch DNA. You can be real careful about touch DNA. Because touch DNA is, is, you know, if I touch something here, if I touch this and I hand it to you and you take it and chuck it in your car, my DNA might be in your car. And when I end up dead and they check your car, they're going to say you murdered me. <laughs> so you be very careful about what the meaning of things are. In Jean Bonnet case, they had touched DNA and they're like, oh, look, see, some stranger killed Jean Bonnet. Okay, all the evidence doesn't point to a stranger. I don't know where the touch of DNA came from. It could have come from the factory. It could have come from the laundromat. It could have come from some, somebody touched, you know, was clean, washing clothes and somebody touched it. It could have been, who the heck knows? It doesn't prove anything. So this is the problem with DNA. It is excellent for certain things as long as it makes sense and it's dangerous for other things if it you know you can't prove it in a, in a in a rational way so yes and no so i'm sure i'm sure kathleen zellner will come up with she'll vacuum something <laughs> oh my goodness oh that that's a good point annalise that says if you want to destroy a woman's history just use sex cleopatra ambulin marie antoinette sarina alexander yeah you know Cleopatra was called a vamp because she was able to get Julius Caesar and she was able to get Anthony, uh, Mark Anthony, uh, not Octavian, he was cold fish. But anyway, um, in reality, all there, for, throughout history, you know, different um, monarchies have always connected with other monarchies in order to, to, to maintain power and to increase power. Uh, Cleopatra wasn't really a beautiful woman. She wasn't considered beautiful. She did pretty good with makeup and hair and all that crap. She was pretty smart, but I don't believe she spoke how many languages. They claim she spoke like 10 languages. That's garbage. I'm sure she didn't. 
I'm sure she maybe she said hello. I can I can say hello in ten languages. <laughs> Doesn't make me speak ten languages. I think that's nonsense. Um, that's all. That's all silly. This. But when Julius Caesar met her, she was the queen of Egypt. She had a great civilization. She owned a lot of stuff. Hooking up with her was not a bad idea. Mark Anthony, hmm, Mark Anthony needed her ships. <laughs> you know, she needed him. He needed her. They hooked up. That isn't about sex. It's about it's about political power. That's that's you know, which is much more sexy in the long run than sex. So, <laughs> what what is that? I tried, oh, I tried to buy the Kindle version, but there's not a buy option. Is there a Kindle version? I got, I, hold on one sec. I got to check this out because sometimes they, they screw me and move, remove my books from certain, um, certain methodologies of buying. Let me, let me check out what's, what's happening with, with, with Clio now. Oh, they change the prices all the time too. Um, yes, there is a Kindle version right now. It, yeah, it exists. Um, it is eleven forty nine in America. That's what it is right now, and twenty bucks on a paperback. Yeah, I don't have any control over that. Um, one of the things I'm all my books from now on are most likely going to be self pub through um, Amazon, so I can charge very small prices like two ninety nine, three ninety nine, four ninety nine. But I can't control the prices from the publishers, and they just go up and down willy nilly. It's hard. It's hard to say. But right now, yeah, it is available. Uh, right now, that one is available. At, on Kindle. Uh, my book, How to Save Your Daughter's Life, is not available on Kindle. It pisses me off because I really want people to read it. And the only way you can get it is by buying a, I think you have to actually buy, like go to eBay and buy a paper copy because they're not even printing it, but they have it on audio, you know, and, and there's some woman reading it, not me, and she's got a horrible voice and it annoys the hell out of me. It sucks. But that's, oh, <laughs> just bought the book. Oh, well, there you go. So there are links below to most of my books, I think. And that does help the channel too. So, <laughs> um, oh, well, thank you very much. Oh, that's nice. Patch channel is exciting. I'm recommending her Knox video to people. Thank you very much. You know, um, again, just as I as I wrap up here, you know, this is an educational channel, and and the reason I say that over and over and over again is because I got people coming on here trying to prove cases. I'm, you know, my opinion on on, on the Melgar case is not going to be popular. Um, because I'm going to get a lot of people who come through and they're going to tell me, oh, you're completely wrong. Uh, this is all the reasons that uh, she's innocent, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and I end up blocking most of them because they're not here to learn. They're here to express their opinion about how I'm wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, <laughs> go do that on your own channel. <laughs> you know, we're not having a discussion. We're not having an interesting discussion like we've had here. Um, we're having just, you know, it's just somebody who's, on her, on the innocent side, wants to say she's innocent, and they'll, they don't care about any of the information I've given. They just want to make their point. Um, again, this is an educational channel. So if you're coming here, it's to learn what I have to teach you about profiling and crime scene analysis. I don't even care if you think I'm right or wrong, but it's to learn something. This was to learn something. Now, you can take this information I've given you about how easy it is to, to, to make it look just like that, really simple, very quick, that she could indeed have done this. And you can take that and do what you want with it. But I just wanted you to, to see it and to understand it. And the 16-hour issue, nobody's talking about it. Nobody tells me why she was laying in a closet for 16 hours. She was not unconscious for 16 hours, tied up like that. It's impossible. She could have a couple hours I'll go with, but not 16 hours. It's that, who? Why is nobody talking about that? It's absolutely nonsense. You know, and that she never struggled for 16 hours. And she didn't say to the detectives, it was horrible. You know, I was trapped in the closet for uh, a whole day and I, nobody was coming. And, and I wanted, I kept calling for my husband and I didn't get a response. And I, I was, you know, I didn't know what had happened to him. None of that. None of that. She had none of that. And that's why the cops, I think, were like, we're having a problem with it. Now, they didn't mention the 16 hours, which I thought was, I mean, I don't know why nobody mentions the 16 hours. It blows me away. But uh, that's why I bring it up. Uh, uh, in my shows, I try to bring up the things that I see from the evidence, especially if people have never talked about that before. Something that they're overlooking that I want people to understand exists, that there is the, what's that word? 
<laughs> what I keep forgetting. What is that word? Rational inference. God, I'm going to have to work on that one. It's just not in my head. I want them to understand that this is rational inference. And that this is a piece of evidence that should have been paid attention to. And for some reason, nobody's paying attention to it. Um, and not because I'm trying to blame that she's guilty or say that she's innocent. It's not that. I want you to understand the case itself. That's that's why this is an educational channel. Not not for armchair profiling, not for not for joining a team to, to do anything. It's just just to learn stuff. And, uh, you know, that's why I recommend the other channels that I like uh, Ken Main's channel and the the the, the uh, What's his name? Um, the new one. I saw the Murder Academy guy, who unfortunately may not be doing any more stuff. I hope he does because he's going to teach something. And even if you know, I say he might not agree with everything I teach or my my analyses, but I hope he appreciates the fact that I'm trying to teach, and I, I appreciate the fact he's trying to teach, and therefore we can all learn something. And I think learning and understanding is better than just going off on some kind of, you know. Oh, you know, I, I think that person is never going to go. You're going to protest at their house, even though I have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, I, I just don't like to see that stuff. Oh, Doreen says, oh, I love that book. I still have a proper cop, a paper copy of it somewhere. I'm talking about how to save your daughter's life. Yeah, I'm hoping I can get, you know, I'm hoping, Doreen, that one day I can get the rights back on that book. Um, that's, a, that's a tough, tough thing to try to get the rights back from the publisher. I'd like to get the rights back so I can put it on Kindle and so I can get the paperback version back and at a reasonable price. But eh, I don't know if I have any luck with that one. Um, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, not, you can't get the Kindle version. I don't understand that. It should exist. So you, you can always try Barnes & Noble. I guess they might have it. I don't know. Um, but it should, be on, it should be on Kindle. I don't know what country you're in. Uh, sometimes there's weird things with different countries. But usually it's available everywhere worldwide on on Amazon, especially Kindle, because you just click a button and it shows up and they make money. So they don't care. <laughs> so um, I said publishing world is a whole nother issue. So everything I'm hoping everything I do from now on will be self-published so, so I can, you know, I don't have to do with publishers and I can give you a decent price. So, oh, and I'll tell you, ask this question. How, how do you lose rights to your book? Well, you know, here's what he, here's what happened. And it's all the fault of Kindle. And, and the audiobooks. So Audible, like what used to happen is they used to publish your book. And as soon as they stop publishing your book in paper form, like let's say How to Save Your Daughter's Life comes out and it used to be in Barnes and Noble and, you know, Bookland and all that. And you could go there and you could buy the book and you could buy it off of Amazon too, but you could buy the, the paper book. Once upon a time when that's all they had was paper books or, you know, hardback books, but they didn't have Kindle or Audible. So everything was there. As soon as they stopped publishing it, then your book was out of print. And once it got out of print, you could get the rights back. But because of Kindle and Audible, your book is never, ever not on the market. So you never can get your rights back. It really sucks. you know. So it's very hard to retrieve your rights on anything. Sometimes you can go to them and say, look, you're not selling anything. Can I please have my rights back so I can sell it for $2.99 and not you know, $20.99? because you're not selling it anyway. Sometimes you can get lucky and the publisher will just say, yeah, we, you can have your book back. We don't care. But they can have your rights forever now. It's really unfortunate. <clears throat> so. Oh, thank you very much. That's nice, Christine. You make a difference in giving us your analysis and teaching us. Thank you. I, I, I say I hope to educate, but more than anything else, because you know, I'm, I'm hoping to train the next generation, you know, detectives, criminal justice people, criminal profiles of the future. Uh, people just want to understand life. Um, you know, that I can, I feel like do more use there than just tell, tell us a, a scary story. <laughs> Somebody else can tell a scary story. Oh, though, I don't know that I will ever touch the Lord Luke in case Gretchen, because that is so complicated, but I, 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 it's on my list. I just don't know. Some, some things are so overwhelmingly complicated. I say, unless somebody pays me, I'm not good. I don't have, I don't have 500 hours to do it. <laughs> um, what is that? Oh, Louis, I think I know that another case that intrigues me is the Lois, Lo, Lois Duncan case. Who killed my daughter? Never saw. No, okay, I have to take a picture of that. I'm going to put that on my list because I, that, that I, it rings a bell to me, and I don't know why it rings a bell, but it does definitely rings a bell. Um, I'll put it on my list because uh, I can't quite remember it. So, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, the, I mean, it's amazing how many how many cases are out here, and uh, some are some are solved cases that I disagree with. There are people I think that didn't do it. I mean, I know everybody thinks I'm anti innocence project, and I'm not real fond of them. But it doesn't mean I don't believe there's some people who are wrongly in prison. And then there are many cases where you know nobody's been imprisoned, and uh, the case is still unsolved. Uh, so, you know, it's, unfortunately, there's a whole lot. <laughs> oh no, I, I disagree with that. Uh, 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 the, uh, you say the uh, the Lucan case is fascinating. Only the Jack the Ripper mystery is more convoluted. Not at all. Uh, I, I will do my I will do my uh, video on Jack the Ripper. I've already done the mystery files on Jack the Ripper. I have a Jack the Ripper suspect. I find the case not all that brilliant. Uh, it's just too many people have gotten out there trying to make money uh, and writing stupid books, claiming things like Wal Walter Sickert. I think the artist. Oh, the artist was Jack the Ripper. Oh, it's the prince was Jack the Ripper. None of that is. It's all nonsense. Jack the Ripper was a local dude in the neighborhood, the regular guy. I mean, the problem is when I did Mystery Files and it was a regular guy that did the that I put I have as a suspect. It, it wasn't taken well by the public because it wasn't that interesting. They wanted something, somebody, something cool. They wanted the prince. They wanted the artist. They want something. They want, they want some big person. They didn't just want some local dude down the block. I kind of ruined all the glamour of the Jack the Ripper case. When I did it. And, you know, I, I was really pleased that the production company was, they liked my analysis of the case. They thought it was reasonable and rational. And they brought me over to London and I did my, I did the show, but I pro they probably regretted it because you know, the, the show didn't do well, probably because it wasn't very interesting to people because it wasn't anybody famous or big. And people like that crap. You know, they want the big, huge mystery. And I was like, yeah, it's that guy down the block. <laughs> you know, Jack the Ripper was uh, nobody, nobody special. Let me put it that way. And But I will, I will do a show on him. Um, it was, my opinion was he was the butcher that lived down the block. And there's good evidence to, to back that up. And so I would, I, I did the, the, the miss, I was going to write a book on it, but I don't have the energy. So I might just do a show on it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, what is this? Uh, if you want a crazy story, this girl was my BFF in the eighties in Tampa, Florida. She was murdered. Cheryl Ann Conmesso. She was murdered by Franklin Delano Floyd. He kidnapped his ex-wife's daughter of three. Uh, you know, I don't usually do stories where it all depends if there's something to talk about, you know, because there's a lot of creepy guys out there who do creepy things. Um, and if I got nothing to say about it, so, yeah, that's a creepy dude. That again is one of these things that people who do um, talk about crimes, true crime people, some of the ladies who do the makeup, make mystery, you know, mystery and makeup type of thing. They'll talk about the crime and they'll put up the pictures. Oh, this guy was born here and then he met so-and-so and then he, this is what happened and he killed so-and-so. It's a good story, but there's nothing uh, profiling wise that serves any purpose for me to talk about it. You know, if it's a story, it's a story. So I have to have some good reason to discuss it. So that's one of the issues is, is there, is there something that I can talk about? Um, first story was, how is it on, how is it on unsolved mysteries? First story was on unsolved mysteries has been solved, but there's a little boy he kidnapped from a school that has never been found. Okay. Well, then he, I don't know how that's unsolved because if he kidnapped her and the child, they just can't find the child's body. That's not really unsolved. They know who did it. They just, you know, finding kids, especially in Florida, where you got the crocodiles and stuff. I mean, alligators, alligators, alligators in Florida. Swamps are good places, you know. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. I've read about the, Jack, Joe says, I've read about the Jack the Ripper for decades and totally agree with you that the killer was a regular guy who lived in the local area, but who I know who's on my short list. Yeah. Um, I, I forgot. <laughs> here's what's really sad. You want to see what's okay. You want to see what's really sad, Joe? Okay. I'm going to have to, <laughs> here's what I do. Cause I forgot his name. <laughs> Even though I did the show on it. Okay. So I put in profile, I put in a, uh, uh, Jack, the Ripper, Jack, the Ripper profiler, Pat Brown. And I find out what the hell I thought. Profiler, I'll tell you who it is, and then I will do a show on it. Um, it was okay. So I, I profiled a new Jack the Ripper. Oh, fine. Jeez. Okay. Can I can I at least say who it was? It's um, it's uh, it's the butcher. It's a uh, God bless. Where is it? 
Uh, why can't I find it? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, it's 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 a, it's a local book. Oh shoot! Now, now I've got stuff on here I don't want. Uh, it's a it, it's a local. It, it's uh, come on now. Okay, I, 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 if I pull up Jack the Ripper suspects, I I'll find it. Hold on a second. This is sad, I know, but suspect list. Okay, I can tell you who it was. I pulled the suspect list up. Okay, it is Jacob Levy. I think it was. I think it was Jacob Levy. Uh, Jacob Levy was uh, his brother was actually a suspect. He was not. Let me see if I'm right. If that's the name of the guy. I've got. I've got all the records elsewhere. Yes, that's it. Jacob Levy. <laughs> um, he was a local butcher. And um, he 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 accessed prostitutes, and I think he you know, and he the, one of the interesting things about Jacob Levy was that be, being a butcher, if he brought parts of ladies back to his shop and had blood there, big deal, you know what I mean? Who 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 would pay any attention because he always has blood and parts in his shop, you know? Uh, he was married, um, but he was seeing prostitutes in the neighborhood, and I think he got syphilis and died. I can't quite remember. So it would be Jacob Levy. No, it wasn't Hyam. No, 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 no. It's not Hyam Levy. No, no. Jake Jacob Levy. Hyam might have been his brother. Um, it, it, but no, it's Jacob Levy. Um, here's the ex I, I'm going to the newspaper. I'm going to the Express now. Jack the Ripper plagued the streets of London. Okay, and then it says, blah, blah, blah. Where am I in this? Ah, but criminal profile at Pat Brown is slightly altered take on the meaning behind the message. That was on the night of the killing. Da, 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 da. So I go on about that. Yada, yada. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Jack the Ripper may have contracted, con contracted syphilis from a prostitute. And that's why he took his own form of barbaric revenge out on sex workers. Um, Brown believed the murderer could have been a Jewish tradesman from the area, specifically a butcher due to his anatomical knowledge and his ability with a blade. Um, so in this particular instance, I think that Jack the Ripper is Jewish, but being Jewish has nothing to do with him being Jack the Ripper. Because and then an interesting thing about that was that um, what well, interesting thing about that is because I actually think he happened to be Jewish, which by the way I'm half Jewish, so that a lot of people don't want to touch it because then they go, oh God, you know, don't say that. <laughs> So, so people, the, the media is a weird thing. They're afraid to say things. Oh, you yeah, don't go there. You know, so it's like, hey, it's not because he was Jewish. It's just he happened to be. There's a big difference between the two things. So, um, yes. Yeah, so I believe it was Jacob Levy. Um, lots of evidence points to that. But I have, I have to go. I have a huge amount of notes on this case. Uh, I, I talked about it. Oh, it's been almost 10 years now since I went to London. Um, so, you know, my, my knowledge of what I actually believe and figured out is all it's all in my uh you know it's all in my notes so i'd have to reread everything about the case but i will do a whole show on that once explaining all the reasons i believe it's jacob levy um and so that will be part of my historical profiling list when i get to it because there's so many cases you know so many cases <laughs> so he says jacob levy interesting yeah you know, he was a very special guy you know it's like you know, a person who goes out and, and kills prostitutes on the street. I mean, this guy wasn't taking them back to his place. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, doing anything special with them. He just attacked them and, and, and sliced them up um, right there and then. And then he walked back home. So, you know, this isn't going to be the prince. This isn't going to be anybody famous. This is going to be some local crackpot who, you know, some serial killer who's got a deranged thing in his head. I also believe, by the way, Joe, that he was not responsible for the, the final murder, Mary, uh, what's her name, in the house, that, that was not Jack the Ripper. And I did explain that also in the show. I do not believe he, that was Jack the Ripper at all. So uh, I think that was mislabeled. Uh, so, yeah. So. <laughs> so anyway, I will, do, I will do a show on that because I, I love historical crime, but as only as so many of them, I have enough... It, information to go on um so when they came to me about cleopatra i'm like you know that's two thousand years old you think i'm going to come up with anything and then i was like oh my god i've got so much information and when i went to egypt because i could see things and i could check out the architecture and all this stuff 
and learn about all the methodologies of tomb building and 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 and, and canal building and stuff like that. I'm like, huh, I actually can figure this one out. But a lot of times you're like, I haven't got a clue because it's just everything's so long gone and so so questionable. You're just like, yeah. I waste my time with it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's one. Yeah, Mary Jane, uh, Mary Jane Kelly. Um, uh, sh this was somebody she knew who I think was um, trying to make it look like Jack the Ripper. Yeah, I, I forgot. I forgot the whole details of it, but I, the, I think I don't know. Was a boyfriend or I had something figured out there, and I'm just not quite sure. Um, <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> Jeff says, really looking forward to Jack the Ripper show. I have a hundred questions to ask you. Now I live in fear. <laughs> Just, you know, just, the, my favorite story about the question things is that, you know, one of the problems with doing live anything is that when people ask you a question, if you don't know the answer, you're so screwed. And I, I was doing a show in Ohio once and, um, I was on the road for my book and uh, I was doing a morning show in Ohio and it was about my book on serial killers, killing for sport. And, and, and we're going into the studio the you know, cameras are waiting. I go to the, the guy says, well, anything you want me to ask you? And I said, well, I can tell you what, don't ask me. Don't ask me any names because I can never remember names. And this is, so I don't have Alzheimer's. I never could remember names. I'm like, don't ask me any specific names because I'm so screwed if you do that. So we sit in the, I'm on the couch with the dude and they say, oh, we're here with Pat Brown. So Pat, Tell me, what's the name of the most prolific serial killer of all time? And I'm like, didn't I just ask you not to ask me that? I'm thinking, I know it's this Russian guy. <laughs> you know, it's the Russian guy. I couldn't remember the guy's name. Saved my life. So, you know, I had to do the political thing. I went, well, you know, it, it's always the serial killer that gets that doesn't get caught. He's the most prolific of all time because we never caught him. So he could just keep going. <laughs> so, so screwed. Um <laughs> but um you know uh and george joe george hutchinson what about what about george hutchinson what about him uh there okay you know one of the one of the tricky things about and here's what happens with a lot of any crimes is george hutchinson and i i don't remember all, all the all the suspects there's like there's like a, a massive amount of suspects um is george hutchinson one of them good lord i i don't know Stuart Hutchinson, Chicka Taylor. <laughs> what is that? The, is that the Russian dude's name, Lisa? Is that it? Chick oh yeah, yeah, that's his name. Yeah, that one, Chick Chick Chicka Tilo or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, him. <laughs> oh, George Hutchinson. Oh, Joe's saying George Hutchinson was po a possible candidate for killing Mary Jane Kelly. I don't remember Joe. I, it's all in my notes. That's all I can say. I. I, I, you know, at the time when I went to, uh, went to London, um, you know, I did all my studies. I was doing all my research and, you know, I, I got everything down and I did the show. And I think in the show, I may have actually said who I thought killed, killed Kelly, but I haven't seen the show in a long time too. So, <laughs> you know, I don't remember what I said, you know, hopefully I said, you know, I, I'm always a little concerned that when I go back, I go, well, that was stupid. <laughs> Why did I say that? But most of the time I go back and I'm not too displeased. So, but I, I, I do, I don't remember who it was. And I, but there, I, I definitely know, I, I definitely know that I knew who I thought it was, but I'll have to find out. So when, when I do the show, I'll, I'll go through all of that again. No, is that him? George Hutchinson claimed to see Mary Kelly with a foreigner wearing an, uh, a fancy named, coat which i can't read um yeah i, I don't I, it's I, it's it's vague in my head it's sort of ringing a bell but i just can't remember so but i i will um i, I will definitely do that in the show let me look i'm gonna look here and see if it says anything uh no no this this one doesn't say anything about mary kelly eh. oh i just say something here about um about Jacob Kelly, his wife, he was having problems, uh, was having problems with his wife. He was failing in his business. He wasn't doing his job anymore. And he was wandering all over the streets at night. I don't know where he is. That's what his wife said. Um, so interesting. Yeah, I say uh, my memory doesn't serve me well, but so 
Yes, but I will do. I will do that one day because I really want to do Cleopatra. I want to do Jack, uh, Jack the Ripper, and uh, I might add a few more to the uh, the um, historical list when I find if there are good cases to do. Like 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 Lizzie Borden. I don't know if there's enough information for me to be able to determine whether I think she's guilty or not. You know, I just don't know. I don't know whether the information I can analyze. Uh, to any realistic degree. So I, I don't know. Cause you know, the, the media lied back then. They still lie today. So <laughs> it's always hard to deal with things when you're dealing with the media because, um, Oh yeah. Because I was telling you about how, um, about how she changed her story that after she got in prison, she said that she saw this girl while she was being tied up in the closet. The guy was behind her tying her up in the closet and she saw an angry girl looking at her. But one of the one of the shows just cut that part out, and they have they have a short version of it, but that's not in there. And I think they thought, oh, that we don't want to put that in there, and so they just cut it out. And so that's what happens. You oftentimes don't get the truth, and I guess they thought that made her look guilty, so they decided not to put it in because they have an agenda. They're not concerned about the actual truth because if somebody is there and they give you an entire statement, the entire statement should be there and let people let let the chips fall where they may and let people make their own determinations. But they decide to edit things, and it was cleverly edited out. And 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 then you know she just looks pitiful and sad, and she says she doesn't know what happened. But they left that out, and that to me is fascinating because how is it that years later she got amnesia, and years later she suddenly remembers being tied up, and who was there at the time, which means then she was actually more awake than she said she was, which is again. Then what happened to the next 16 hours? <laughs> if, you were being, if you were being tied up, why weren't you struggling? Why weren't you fighting? Why were you being tied up? I mean, you know, it, that's another, that made her look even more guilty, in my opinion. So there we go. Uh, an, that's an interesting question. Wouldn't a assailant get behind a victim in a closet? I think he'd tie her up and kick her into the closet. You would think, wouldn't you? I, I go with that one. I don't know why she'd be facing out. That's a very good point because, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, why would he turn her around? Well, that way she could that way she could be tied up and see the supposed young woman who suddenly is also part of a home invasion team. <laughs> um, Star Child says, I personally think her uncle did it, not Borden. Her father had enemies. I think it was her father's brother who disliked him. Hmm. All right. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up. So, you know, and the, and the problem is, again, what's, what's, I, I'm going to really work on this. I tell you, I can't remember them. Okay. Well, now my notes are gone. Oh, crap. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay, so again, uh, rational inference versus speculation. So even, even in historical crimes, are you speculating or is there actually evidence? Or are you just picking somebody else who could have done it? And, th and this is what happens even with, 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 with uh, historical stuff. It's like, well, oh, Jack the Ripper could have been the prince. I'm like, why? What evidence do you have in this crime that would link to the prince? And they come up, there's nothing. Walter Sickert? That was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, it was Patricia uh, Cornwell. Cornwall? Cornwell? Who writes writes the mystery stories. Uh, and, the, and the mystery stories are fine. She should have stayed a fiction author. She's, but she spent this lot of money with this crazy idea that Walter Sickert, the artist, was suddenly Jack the Ripper. And she should have, she's not a profiler. She should have stayed a fiction writer. <laughs> it's like, your speculation was all over the place and made no sense. So, Yes, you could always speculate somebody did something to somebody, but where's the evidence to it? So just because we don't like somebody, this is not a good reason. Like you, you could take the Casey Anthony case and say the same thing. You could simply say, oh, how about this? Cindy thought that Casey was taking, Cindy thought Casey was taking Kaylee away from her, which actually has truth to it because she did. Casey took Kaylee and went off and, and, and Cindy didn't know where uh, Kaylee was. What if? Cindy, well, I don't see why Cindy couldn't have said, you know, Casey, that's my, I've been raising her since she was young. You've never been a good mother. And if you think you're going to run off with Kay Kaylee, well, no, I'm going to make sure that you don't. And so she killed Kaylee. 
I could make that story up. Uh, that's speculation. You know, oh, the reason she said they smelled like a dead body in the trunk is because she knew there was a dead body in the trunk because she put that body in the trunk. That's speculation. That's not rational inference. And so a lot of times when I see with these cases, uh, Jack Ripper has like 20 different suspects. It's ridiculous. And people argue about all these Incredible. Even there's even not Jack the Ripper suspect who's actually an American. And I think he's connected to Zodiac or something. I mean, it's just outrageous. It's just like this, this it's just this fantasy game of us speculating by just pulling things out of the woodwork and making up stuff. That's not correct. So you can do it all you want, <laughs> but I get frustrated because as a profiler, when I put out my information about why Jacob Levy is more likely the guy that this is, rational inference from the crime scene and who he was and the location he was in, et cetera, et cetera. People aren't interested in that. They, they toss that aside real quick because they prefer to go on with the speculation about it's, it's the prince, you know, and that's, you know, it, 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 it's more, it's sexier. You know what I mean? It's just sexier. So let's go there, you know, and, 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 and reality be damned. So I'm always concerned about that. Um, it's just a, it's just a, fr a frustrating thing for me as a profiler. So <laughs> Star Child says, that's why I'll let you, you, not me, do the profiling, Pat. Well, hey, you know, that's why I have this channel is to help people because I believe anybody can profile. Anybody can do crime scene analysis. And that's what I'm trying to teach. So if there are uh, detectives out there, for example, and they say, hey, you know, while I'm sitting in my in my cruiser, you know, I want to be a detective. I'm sitting in my cruiser right now. You know, I'm not a detective, but I want to be one. I'm in my cruiser for a long, a ridiculous amount of hours. Why don't I listen to Pat Brown and see how she analyzes the case? Because if I listen to her, maybe she will teach me some valuable techniques and ways to look at cases, things that I might overlook. I've heard other people say, oh, look, she talked about the 16 hours. I never thought about the 16 hours. So these are methodologies and, and, and ways to look at things which could benefit any police officer, any detective, anybody working in criminal justice. It actually can benefit defense lawyers and prosecutors too. And, you know, a uh, psychologist can learn a little bit better uh, profiling skills because they, they sure sometimes don't seem to know when they got a psychopath sitting in front of them or when somebody's telling them a big bunch of bull, you know? So, you know, this is, a, that's the whole point of this channel is, 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 if I just told stories, it would just be entertainment, which is okay, but that's not what I do. So I want to educate. I want people to learn from me and take that out into the real world because, you know, that's where it's going to be most useful. So <laughs> the prince and the prince and sexy don't belong in the same sentence. I don't know. Was, was the prince back at that time, like a really ugly dude? I, I don't have any, but is that why he needed the prostitutes? I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what he looked like at the time. You know, I don't trust some of those portraits. They're kind of, some of those portraits are kind of cruel. You know what I mean? Sometimes they make you look better, but sometimes I'm like, I can't believe that person looked that bad. You know? <laughs> so, um, See, I'll be okay. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say this just to be just just to say this, and I don't know this book. Another good read is a dissertation on J, the the Jack the Ripper case book, The Butcher Rose Suspect by Ke Scott Nelson. Uh, okay, here's my problem with a lot of these books, and, and you know, they, everybody has the right to write them. I, you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not a person who cancels people. I think everybody has the right to put out their, their stuff. And I don't know about this particular book. But what I get so frustrated with is that as a profiler, I see stories told. They just tell stories and they make up speculations which don't have any basis in evidence. And But, you know, they're good storytellers. So what happens is people read this and they get all like, oh, my God, I guess that could be who it is. And, yeah, they, they explain how, you know, the carriage is going down the road and, you know, in the, in the rainstorm. And then there's, 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 there's ruts in the road and the carriage is swaying, you know, and, and they get a picture in the head and they start believing the crap. But the problem is it ain't true. And there's no evidence that supports it. I have to say, the Butcher Row Suspect. Now, I'm just I'm now, now I'm curious about even I'm going to put this in here just because I'm curious. Um, and I'm not saying there's not good books out there. There are. But I just find that so many people, especially with true crime, will write a story that has absolutely basis in, in any kind of um, Butcher 
It's row. What is it? Suspect. It's not even coming up. Why is it not coming up? Okay. What? Okay, that did not even come up. Is it a different name? Scott Nelson. I'm going to put Scott Nelson in. But, you know, I just I just warn people, not because they shouldn't read the books, but just be just be careful about a lot of people are out to make a buck. And they'll, they're, they're fascinated by things that I cannot find this book. I don't see it any place out here. I don't see Scott Nelson or the Butcher Row Suspect. So I have no idea. That's that's not coming up. Jay, Jack the Ripper casebook. Maybe I'll put that and it'll come up. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I love a good book and I have books that I do love, but I'm always a little concerned when it's, it's, a, it's just stuff that exaggerates stuff and to make money. And let's face it. That's a lot of writing. Oh, here, Jack the Ripper and the case for Scotland Yards. That's a, this one's Robert house. I don't know who the hell this is. Okay. This is Kamin Kosminski. Uh, Kosminski has been a big popular one. Um, I don't see the guy you're talking about here at all. Huh? I don't know. I see Richard James, Rupert Mether. Eh. I see all kinds of people, but not that one. I don't know. I'm not finding it. Facebook, I found, oh, Jack, the, oh, is that the one that's just on the internet? Because because there is one that's on the internet, and yeah, um, you know, um, I, again, not saying it's not, 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 got some good stuff in it, but I just find some of the ripperologists have gone down the rabbit hole, and, and uh, you know, because they've spent so much time analyzing every single absolutely pointless detail that they they start creating a fantasy world. It, 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 it's not what what actually happened. It's their fantasy world of what happened, and they 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 they, they lose con they lose they lose a sense of just reality and just basic facts. Um, and when I looked at, when I looked at this case and, you know, the basic facts just didn't point to half the crap that people were coming up with. And I'm like, why are they, they just, this just craziness, just crazy stuff. Um, and they, they make some compelling cases, but it's not based on evidence. It's all speculation. And that's what, that's why, um, but <laughs> okay. Wait a minute. The, she says, wait a minute, where'd it go? Oh, no, 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 stop this. Oh, dang it. I hate this. They have this. Sorry, Lisa. Oh, my God. I did not block you on purpose. Okay, I'm, I, Lisa, if you're listening to me now, I hit, they have this stupid button on the side, and when I went to click on your thing, my hand slid over, and it's a little dot. I hit the dot, and it says, Lisa was blocked for five minutes. I didn't block you. That's a stupid thing. Okay. I didn't block you. I was trying to put, I was trying to put your little, your, what you were saying up there. You were saying, but it's so much fun. And I was clicking on it to put it on the screen. And now you've been blocked for five minutes. You know what they do in India? They do this. They grab your ears. So I grabbed my ears, Lisa. I didn't mean to block you. <laughs> Please come back. In five minutes, you can come back. Sorry about that. <sighs> It's a stupid, you know, if you're going to divide, you know, you, you put together a methodology here so that you can do these shows. <laughs> Martin, Martin, I almost put you in the sin bin too. Martin says she's Lisa's in the sin bin. Yeah, because it's a stupid, it's stupid. They just got this little spot there. And if you don't click in the middle and you click a little to the right, it just, it just knocks people out. And you put, I'm like, who would develop this stupid thing where you could accidentally hit the wrong thing? You know, you should, it should have to be something you have to work at. Like you click on it and then you have to click on it and say, yes, I want her in the, you know, but to be blocked. So <laughs> no, Martin, I'm not trying to block you either. So, I mean, so, there are some people I do want to block, but not you guys, <laughs> so, you know, but I say StreamYard has its problems. It has weird problems with the overlays, which vanish on me. Um, and then sometimes you can't see the overlays because they think them so small. You're like, am I hit clicking the right one? You know, so, God knows. And now I have missing letters. And you say you don't see it on your side. I have all your let when I put these on the screen, I can't read them because half the letters are missing. <laughs> oh, I just love live stuff. It's just all terrible. Um <laughs> oh my goodness. So anyway, but uh, so my simple point is the whole the whole point of today is rational inference as opposed to speculation. Um 
So when you do read all these things about Jack the Ripper and there's 700,000 different books and, and websites and people who are truly obsessed with Jack the Ripper and what they've become by going down the rabbit hole, then like, like the evidence is sitting here in the small little pile, but the big rabbit hole is so big that they all fall down the rabbit hole. And then they investigate every single tunnel they can investigate. And, you know, people get all really into it. And, and most of it is just, just simply not based on evidence. So, um, but it, it is, it's more exciting. And so sometimes um, I was really surprised they even did the show on Jack the Ripper because I thought they were, I accidentally ended up with the show. Um, and I was surprised they, they let me come because I'm like, you know, I'm talking about the local butcher, you know, you really want to do a show about this? And, and they, I think this was one of the best production companies I ever worked with. And I feel badly because probably it ruined their show <laughs> because I probably didn't make much money off of it because I didn't have an exciting suspect and I probably pissed, pissed off a lot of the Jack, the Ripperologists and, they, I've never gotten a good response from the Ripperologist, believe me. Like, I mean, I've looked it up. I thought, you know, after I did that show, but Pat, profile of Pat Brown, Jacob Levy, I'm like, there's nothing on Google. <laughs> I got three, like three, three links. I'm like, wow, they really hated that concept. You know? <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, before I lock, knock anybody else off of here, I'm going to now go have my little dinner and, um, so I should be back on Wednesday uh, with a with a hangout. If you're not, if you want to participate in hangout and you would like to be here for the actual live hangout, then you have to join Patreon and click on the third level. Um, and I should be here for the theoretical midnight um, Asia show where I'm doing Peter Falconio, the Australian crime. That is, I, I am actually working with a production company this week. Uh, doing a thing on serial killers. Um, and so if I get overwhelmed with that, because I, you know, they're kind of slow on getting me all the information they want me to talk about, and I'm going to do massive research. So if I get a little overwhelmed with that, I might have to skip a show. Uh, but uh, otherwise, otherwise, I will be doing Peter Falconio on the midnight show for the, for uh, on Saturday morning for Asia and Oceana. Uh, and I do not know what next week is going to be, but we'll think about that at some point. <laughs> uh oh, did I piss off the Ripperologist? <laughs> you are a Ripperologist. Did, did I make you upset? <laughs> well, what you have to wait. You know, when I uh, I'll do the show, and then you have to tell me because you're going to have to give me your 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 great opinion on it because you know people who are very 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 uh, into it. Uh, I say they might, they have not been fond of my opinion because I say he's just kind of a, he's kind of a dullard, you know what I mean? Which is actually rational. See, this is rational inferences. A guy who will go around killing prostitutes and ripping their innards out is not usually a guy who's done well in life. He's usually a guy who's in trouble. Um, it's very much, you know, you see a lot of this stuff, like homeless guys will do this kind of thing. You, you know, the, you, you know, your guy is not usually doing real well. So the fact is your, your suspect is probably just going to be a guy who's a, a mess. Jacob Levy. So there you go. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I say he's not a sexy suspect. So. Yeah, you know, so it's not wasn't popular. So I, I'll have to see what I say. I'm curious to see what you all think about it. Now that you're such great profiling pupils, I'll have to see if you go, oh, that makes sense, Pat. Or you're like, yeah, and you just, uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Joe says, I'm a ripperologist too, Pat. <laughs> and I'm very eager to hear what your take is on Levy. It's about finding who the J ripper was, not glamorous entertainment. Well, you know, you say that, Joe, but. People like entertainment more than they like truth, <laughs> right? That's just the way it is. Pink Lacks, wonderfully presented show. Thank you very much. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, you know, it's uh, it was it was a much more interesting show than I thought it was going to be because I was so fascinated by this case of Ms. Melger, um, and and I and I honestly, I really hoped that she didn't do it. You know, because I look at this couple and I'm like, ah. They do seem like a nice couple. And so it's just like sad. I'm, I saw her daughter talking and she's lost her dad to homicide. She doesn't want to lose her mother to prison. 
The family seemed to love them. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, I, I have a hard time want, thinking that this, this could have happened. But, you know, I don't know what she was really like. I don't know where the truth lies in that. But I just know that her story did not make her look good. It really didn't. But, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave out there Kathleen Zellner. Uh, I am horrible in this case. And uh, if I could find a way to prove her innocent, if I could look at other things and say, my God, that story, strange as it is, there's some there's there's reasons for it. If I could prove her innocent, I'd be happy to do it. I really would. Um, if I'm here, I can't find her innocent, but I wouldn't mind proving her innocent. So, you know, I'm available. Even if I disagree with you entirely 100% on Stephen Avery. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me go eat some dinner now and uh, I will see you guys next time. I hope I wasn't too long missing when I or whatever covered me up and I vanished behind a, a screen of darkness, um, <laughs> which really sucks. I hate that when it happens. Uh, and I worked so hard to not let it happen anymore, but I guess I blew it again. Sometimes I just can't see it. You know, I just really can't. Um, so. But anyway, I appreciate you still being here, and I hope that anybody comes to watch us afterwards doesn't just say, you know, what the hell? I don't need to watch any more of this show. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I will see you on the next round, uh, and I appreciate you being here, and I thank you for supporting the channel. You just are awesome, awesome people. <laughs>